2023 budget. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Still muted there, sorry about that. Ms. Lacey, good morning. Good morning, present. Ms. Pickard. Present. Mr. Volke. Present. Mr. Prusky. Here. Ms. Fiedler. Present. Ms. Rodzian. Present. Ms. Hare. Present. And Ms. Bolaire. Present. Madam Chair, we have all seven council members and our county auditor in attendance. Thank you very much. At this time, please pause for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance, which I will lead today. Um, as we go forward in this meeting today, please give us wisdom and kindness and strength to make the decisions that are best for our constituents and our county as a whole. And please join me for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Madam Secretary, please read the Open Meetings Act statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Maryland Open Meetings Act is a state law that requires public meetings to be open to the public and to be held in places reasonably accessible to individuals who would like to attend these meetings. While a virtual meeting was not envisioned by the Open Meetings Act, steps have been taken to ensure that this virtual meeting includes alternate accessibility features that the Open Meetings Act Compliance Board and the courts have once reviewed and approved, such as having a call-in phone number that allows anyone with a telephone to call and listen to the meeting, broadcasting the meeting with video and audio on cable TV and the web, and allowing the public to register via Zoom and watch the meeting using Zoom. The public access provided by this technology makes this virtual meeting reasonably accessible to the public as required by the Open Meetings Act. Thank you very much. Is there any item any council member would like to place on the agenda? All right, seeing none, we will begin today's presentations. Our first department is the Department of Inspections and Permits. All presenters, please remember to introduce yourself and continue to introduce yourself before you speak each time. Um, our presenters today, I'll introduce you the first time. Um, we have Mark Wiedemeyer, Katie Barker, Jay Lashinsky, I apologize if I didn't get that correct, Andrew Makara, Ragu Badami, and Darlene Flynn. And you may begin your presentation whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Darlene Flynn with the Budget Office. The Department of Inspections and Permits budget begins on page 193 in the uh, recommended budget book. I will be going over page 194, which is the comparative statement of expenditures. There are um, multiple funds in the Department of Inspections and Permits, and I'll go over some of those changes. But overall, the uh, recommended budget is 17.6 million, which is an increase of 1.1 million from um, FY22 approved budget. The majority of that increase in the 1.1 million is from um, 1.2 million in the general fund. Then there's some slight reductions in the watershed protection and restoration fund and the reforestation fund. The reduction in the watershed protection and restoration fund is basically because of turnover savings. Um, the, that was about 73,700. Then there's a reduction in the reforestation fund of 103,400, and that was a result of a shift of a position to the general fund. So those are the overarching changes in the fund at the fund level. If you look below, you'll see um, I'd like to go over the object level budget. In personnel services, there's an increase of $633,200 over FY22. And the majority of that is countywide, is the countywide pay package um, and some adjustments to historical budget levels or expense levels. The um, contractual services increase of 35,000 is basically an increase in some of the um, loon cost, Wi-Fi costs. And um, we've also transferred the Gypsy Moth program into uh, IAP from DPW. And that was about 10,000 of that 35,000. Under supplies and materials, there's an increase of $1,300. And again, that's aligning with historical costs. We did take a reduction of 9,000 in business and travel. 
And again, that was aligning with historical costs. There's an, a decrease of 55,800 in capital outlay. And that was uh, as a result of basically uh, two vehicles that were purchased in FY22 that were considered a one-time purchase. So that reduction is that 55,800. And then under grants, contributions, and others, you'll see a $500,000 increase. And that is for an active one-time grant to the Chesapeake Bay Trust for conservation easements. So are there any questions? I know that's a lot of information. If not, I can hand it over to the department. Yep. I think that would be fine to go ahead and hand it off to the department. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Mark Wiedemeyer with uh, the Department of Inspections and Permits. Um, quickly, I just wanted to introduce our staff as you look at us. To my right is Jay Lachinsky. To my left is Katie Barker, uh, then Raghu Badani and Andrew McCara uh, with our department. So uh, this past year has really been focused on the uh, testing, training, and implementation of the new permitting and inspection system, Loon. So that's been quite a challenge, uh, maintaining all of our daily services and, and getting staff up and ready to go on that. Uh, I would like to thank um, each of you and your legislative assistance with connecting your constituents to us as they've had issues or concerns. Um, it's been a great help and I do appreciate that. With that, we're open to address any questions that you may have relative to the budget. Any questions for my call? Oh, go ahead, Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Why are we switching the Planner 2 position out of the reforestation fund into the general fund? Uh, this is Raghu uh, uh, So the position was, this is uh, uh, a part of a multi-year effort with the administration to make sure the reforestation fund is stabilized. And this is to move the money out of the general fund to ensure the reforestation funds are used to replant forests to mitigate for the loss to the level development projects. State law requires that the department spend as much goes. Uh, the money is collected in the Flindo account to mitigate for the forest loss. So this ensures that the money collected is as closely spent uh, acres lost to the bed. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions from my colleagues? I will. Um, I will go ahead and ask one or a couple. Then, actually, how are um, how are the users of the new system responding so far? Have you had any feedback? Yes, I, I would say we've had um, both positive and some negative feedback. What we are doing is uh, Jay is coordinated with the MBIA group, Maryland Builders Association group, to host two training sessions. One will be next Monday and Monday morning, and one will be next Wednesday afternoon. After that, we intend to try and do some public outreach as well for constituents so that they're able to navigate the system. And as we've been moving along, we've been able to get back to more inquiries that have come in in a, in a quicker time frame. Okay, thank you. And I guess a related question is how is it, go, how is it um, internally? How is it going internally? I, I would say internally it's gone much better. We're off to a little bit of a rocky start uh, just with such a significant change. I think, but within the first two weeks we were able to have things in order and people able to, um, you know, rely upon each other to navigate the system and, and think we've really made a lot of progress. So I think it's going much smoother. Uh, inspectors uh, with our building group are able to enter their results in the field. Uh, we've gotten positive feedback from some of the builders that they're able to get their inspection results immediately. If they need a certificate of occupancy for settlements, they're able to get those immediately. It's not there's no lag time, so there, are, there have been some efficiencies definitely created with the system. That's great. That's what I was hoping to hear, and hopefully you'll see more of that as, um, you know, the implementation progresses. 
Um, one last question. Um, where are you in terms of vacancies? So we are currently at 25 vacancies within the department. Uh, we have had a number of retirements over the course of the year. Um, we've been promoting from within, so we've had a bit of backfilling, so that number has kind of remained consistent. We've also faced challenges with recruiting and we're, we're in a competitive marketplace right now, as I think everyone knows and is well aware. So um, we're doing the best that we can to get interviews scheduled quickly and be able to get offers made as quickly as we can to, to fill seats. Oh, I'm sorry, I see Mr. Volke has a question and, and thank you for that reply. I had myself on mute. Um, all right, Mr. Volke, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Wiedemeyer and your team, thank you all for being here and for your help. Um, just following up on that question about vacancies, understanding it's a competitive market, but you guys are running at a significant vacancy rate. I guess the question I would have is, what do you feel is the biggest impediment? And I, I don't want to throw other departments under the bus, but I have heard from other departments, not you all, that part of the issue in the county is personnel and being able to hire and the personnel process and how by the time you have a qualified applicant and they get through the personnel process and you're finally ready to hire them. It could be six, eight, nine months after that person first came in. And in a market like what we have now, um, at that point, that person's already accepted another job and they've moved on. So I guess what I want to understand a little bit is, is it that you just can't find people or is it that by the time you're able to get the job offered to them that they may have taken something else? What is it that you all are seeing? Because with an 18, almost 20% vacancy rate, that's concerning. No, I, I agree. Uh, again, Mark Wiedemeyer, thank you. Um, I agree. I think it's somewhat a combination of factors, uh, especially with the engineering market. Uh, I think that is just related to competition um, and a shortage of people out there, uh, similar to construction inspectors. We have had, um, for example, we had six interviews lined up for we had three, two or three permit processor positions. All six people were no-shows and did not follow up to even say that they were not coming. Uh, I'm not quite sure on the recruitment time on that, but just to not get a response was quite alarming. Uh, I think also with relative to the permit processor position, salaries are quite competitive with the outside industry, even for some of the um, lower level jobs and the, those jobs in the permit center require quite a bit of expertise uh, to deal with the system and knowing zoning requirements and things like that. So, you know, we've also made offers to others, had people sign um, acceptance letters and only to come back and say that they've accepted a position elsewhere and retract their acceptance letters. So I think it's just kind of a, a combination of factors overall with each, each situation. I hope, I hope that addressed your question. It does, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I guess seeing no additional questions from my colleagues, I will say thank you for your time this morning and for giving us an update where you are. I wish you best of luck with the implementation of your new system and hopefully we'll see good progress there. Um, all right, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presenters are uh, our Office of Planning and Zoning. So we will have Stephen Kai Ziegler, Alice Christman, Cindy Carrier, Lori Rhodes, and again, Darlene Flynn. Yes, good morning, Darlene Flynn with the Budget Office. The Office of Planning and Zoning's budget begins on page 184 of the uh, recommended budget. I'll be going over the comparative statement of expenditures on page 185. The recommended budget for the Office of Planning and Zoning for FY23 is 10,858,300 which is a little over a million dollar increase from FY22 approved budget. The majority of the increase is in the general fund with um, a 179,400 increase in grant funds. 
Now, if you go below, I'll go over the object levels on the chart all the way to the right column. The personnel services increased $971,700. Uh, this is a result of three new positions, a slight increase in contractual pay and the countywide pay package. There is no overall increase in contractual services, but as I mentioned earlier, there was a $179,000 increase in grants. Um, that was all in contractual services, but we also had some reductions in the general fund. So overall, it's a zero impact. The supplies and materials uh, increased 64,100, and the majority of that is for printing mail and mailing costs and some scanning costs. The business and travel object level increased 9,500. Um, that increases for training and certification costs. <clears throat> and then we also have an increase of $31,000 in capital outlay, and that is a result of a vehicle purchase. We also have an increase of 13,100 in grants contribution and other, and that's a uh, BMC dues increase that um, began in 22, but we'll recognize it in 23. So are there any questions on those changes? Great, then I'll turn it over to the department. Thank you. Go ahead, thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Steve Kai Ziegler, Planning and Zoning Officer. It's a privilege to be here to present our budget. We, I don't think we'll take much time. I'm not going to reintroduce our um, our staff, our panelists, um, because Darlene Flynn has already done that. But we have a very short uh, PowerPoint presentation, if we could uh, put that up. So this is our, uh, our proposed FY23 budget request, which has been supported by the county administration. Next slide. A couple of the things we wanna mention uh, in FY22, we think we had a number of uh, pretty uh, pretty neat accomplishments. We launched uh, master plans for regions 247, leveraging GIS mapping technologies for outreach strategies. We received a sustainable growth award from Maryland Department of Planning for plan 2040. Uh, kicked off the fiscal impact analysis and impact fee studies. Completed the Glen Burnie revitalization plan, finalized adoption of updated critical area maps incorporated a new transportation section from development review. That was the situation where several staff from both INP and the Office of Transportation who worked on development review were essentially reallocated or reassigned to planning and zoning to continue that work in a more cohesive way. Uh, in zoning enforcement, uh, we managed an average of 168 cases per inspector monthly. Next slide. <clears throat> Continuing, we were awarded a $75,000 grant from NOAA and DNR to expand the county's planning for sea level rise and climate change. We completed a two-year Oogle collection curation project, which cataloged 162,000 objects from 154 different sites. We launched a new process and webpage for receiving and reviewing public comments on draft green notices. We collaborated with OIT and IAP to deliver phase two of the land use navigator platform. In terms of recruitment personnel, we've hired or promoted 14 new staff. Approximately seven of those were new and seven of those were internal promotions. Uh, we still have seven vacancies, including two on hold due to requested reclassifications within this budget. Next slide. So looking forward to the next fiscal year, we need to continue region planning processes for regions 247, complete impact fee study and fiscal impact analysis, expanding it to include both libraries and parks and recreation, increase resource support for zoning enforcement, adopt paperless contract tracking, implement a cell loon for transition to digital development review, uh, hopefully adoption of Pearl Town Center and Odenton Town Center master plans, continue to engage communities in the county's cultural resource through interactive programming, ongoing focus as always on process improvement, including retainment and resource strategies. Next slide, please. So this is the, if you wanna say the, the big new requests. Uh, we have requested and the administration supports three new full-time equivalent positions. One is for a zoning inspector supervisor in the zoning enforcement group a new senior planner in the development or regional planning group, and a new zoning inspector within zoning enforcement. We're also requesting a contract position, not a full-time equivalent, but a contract in long range planning. And we wanna to convert two positions. One is conversion of a management assistant to, to a planner to in long range planning, 
and to convert a plan or two to a plan or three in zoning. And the last two items are, are a little bit different. It's for mailings, uh, printing, scanning, all divisions. And the last item on the list is, um, I'm gonna say a expansion of the impact fee study, again, to include libraries, recreation and parks. And that kind of lays out our uh, budget request for this year. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from my colleagues? <clears throat> well, I, it sounds like we uh, we sailed through that. Um, you got a pretty straightforward. Oh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. I think I may have missed a hand. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry. I'm on the screen where I couldn't see you. I thought they would pop up. So I'm not sure who is first. Um, I heard Ms. Fiedler, so you may have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Fiedler, District 5. Thank you, Mr. Kai Ziegler, for that presentation. And Ms. Flynn, I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Kai Ziegler, if I remember correctly, last year at this time, um, when we were talking about vacancies, I believe we had seven at the same time and we were adding seven positions. Are the seven positions where we have vacancies this year in the same category, or could you list the seven vacancies? Um, again, Steve Kai Ziegler, Planning and Zoning Officer. No, they're different. It's it's not as though we got seven new positions last year and we didn't hire anyone. But it's it's a complicated answer because whenever we have a vacancy and we fill it, about half the time it's with a new candidate. The other half of the time, it's an internal promotion. They were the best candidate for the position. What occurs throughout the year, though, is that we have people leave the organization. We have we have two people pending retirement, so that number our number of vacancies is going to go up. But it's uh it's it's um you can only take a snapshot in time as to where we're at because it evolves. It's pretty organic. Okay, so so a vacancy today might not be a vacancy in three days, but we'll have a different vacancy. It, that could happen. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Tracking is difficult on this. We have enormous spreadsheets as to the origin of a position, how it's filled, and the fact that did it create uh, a need to backfill a position because it was an internal candidate. All right, Ms. Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Allison Pickard, District 2. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, one, um, from your district two constituents, um, thank you for all your service to <laughs> zoning enforcement. I think we might be the um, one of the frequent flyers to sending constituent complaints and things your way. So thank you for uh, for that collaboration uh, between our office and yours. I definitely um, understand the need for additional um, positions there. Um, I wanted to though ask about um, the printing um, and and what I'm just going to give a an example. Like we did this beautiful work on the Glen Burnie revitalization plan, and it's um, we have beautiful prints. Uh, we have some beautiful documents. We don't have very many of them though. So I'm just curious if you're looking to be able to produce documents that we can give to the public regarding the hard work that's going on in long-term planning or what is the printing stuff about? So what I would ask in this question is either Alice Christman or Cindy Carrier, because most of the printing is related to long range planning, if you could assist with this question. Sure, this is Alice Christman, Deputy Planning and Zoning Officer for Administration with the Office of Planning and Zoning. I don't believe Ms. Carrier has joined us today, but I can uh, begin addressing your question and then follow up separately if needed. Uh, when the printing request in the Glen Burnie study is a great example of that is um, whenever there is a plan, we plan we print for each iteration and for each audience that needs it. So we print draft plans for the, for example, Planning Advisory Board, Council, and uh, other audiences that request it. So this is an aggressive budget that we're putting forward to make sure that we can make those hard copies available, Ms. Pickard. And please be in touch with us about needs or audiences that you feel need to be receiving these because that can help us make sure that we are appropriately informing our citizens as well. If you'd like a more um, specific breakdown of how we came up with our estimate, we can also provide that to you offline. I don't, I don't necessarily need the estimate. I was just curious because mm -hmm. the council, the county council does not have a printing budget. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I have um, held on tightly to the 30 or so revitalization document 
that I've received so I can give them out sparingly and reuse them at, at community events and things because they are really helpful to talk about when we're talking about the work being done in long range planning. So thank you for that. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. I have uh, two quick questions. The first one is just, could we get a more detailed breakdown of exactly what's in that travel and training budget? So how many trainings, how many people, where they are type of a deal so that Absolutely. we Absolutely. Okay, awesome. And then the second one, just um, touching a little bit on what Councilwoman Fiedler was asking a minute ago, it does seem like there may be some positions that are vacant uh, consistently or over time, they tend to be vacant more often than others. And I'm curious, I can see there's some reclassification here, but also new positions. Has there been any um, discussion or consideration of rather than adding new positions, looking to some of these existing vacancies to, to reclassify them this year rather than adding new positions um, each year? Steve Kaiziglar, Planning and Zoning Officer. Um, it's a combination of both, if that makes sense. And that's why you're starting to see us try and reclass positions. Um, <clears throat> basically, positions that may be somewhat antiquated, because keep in mind, our entire personnel system is codified and all of the job descriptions are codified. They're difficult to change unless it's a legislative action. So, so where we can reclassify position, we're absolutely trying to do it. What we're also doing is we're looking um, not dissimilar to OIT to filling uh, some of our vacancies or meeting other needs through contract positions where they're not full-time equivalent, they don't get the benefits, but they're people who have really amazing skills who might wanna work in a somewhat different environment. So we are always looking at the potential to reclassify a position if it makes sense. The other thing we don't have in play yet that would help us is um, a term in personnel called a career ladder where employees who gain experience, knowledge, education, they don't have to compete necessarily for vacant positions in other groups. Um, it's almost though you, you meet a certain test and you get reclassified to the higher position. And we don't have that for the planning series um, in Anne Arundel County yet, but it's, it's something I think that we're in the beginning stages of trying to explore. We're trying to do everything we possibly can not to have a lot of vacancies. <laughs> Right. Do any of the seven vacancies we currently have fit into that kind of category that you just described as antiquated or need to be updated, changed? I would have to I would have to think about that question before I okay. could respond. I, I'm, I'm thinking not because we're actually every position, whenever it opens up, it's a it's a, a consideration. Could we fill it with a contractor? Do we need to reclassify it? And I think the seven that we have, I don't think we're thinking in terms of that unless, Alice, you have a different thought or more knowledge on it. Um, this is Alice Chrisman, a Deputy Planning and Zoning Officer for Administration. Thank you for that great question, Ms. Hare. And I think that um, it's very interesting that we're following IMP with that question because we're also running into some similar recruitment challenges, particularly for the like just post entry level positions, for example, the planner two. Currently, we have a vacant secretary three position that has roughly 19 applicants. I have one, two planner two positions, one of which had nine total, another one that is still running that has three. I have emailed every single university in the region, and I even went to Harvard. I, I didn't go personally go to Harvard, but I even emailed Harvard to see to their planning just to try to recruit to bounce up those numbers. So we're not just running into, we're running into um, a supply issue as well in terms of trying to feed our recruitment, and we are running into some of the competitive issues in terms of, in terms of salary. But uh, we are working on uh, an internal proficiency proficiency advancement series to determine how we can. Um, help our staff grow and fulfill the needs that we need within that too. So um, the current vacancies are a planner one, a plan two planner twos, um, a planner three, and a secretary three. So thank you. You're welcome. All right, Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District Three. Um, I guess I don't know who the right person is to answer this question, so I'll just sort of direct it generally. I, I've gone back and looked at the FY20 budget because I think sometimes looking backward is helpful to get perspective. I think that in FY19, there were 60 positions authorized by this council in the Office of Planning and Zoning. If the budget request is approved, 
we will be up to 78. That's a 30% increase in positions in planning and zoning over four years. And then I looked at the metrics because the metrics that are being listed today by planning and zoning are different than what planning and zoning used to list. But for the ones that are, they used to list a lot less. Now there are more met metrics listed. But for site development reviews, for instance, I mean, the estimate in FY20 was 245. The estimate for FY23 is 175. So that's gone down. The estimate for building and grading permits back in FY20 was 3,200. And that was down from an actual in FY17 of 4,000. Now we're estimating in FY23, 2,400. So I think what I'm struggling with is I'm seeing a decrease in the number of site development reviews over time building permits and grading permits that are being applied for, but we're seeing this pretty significant increase in staffing in the Office of Planning and Zoning. So I don't know if there's a reason why, I'm assuming you all are probably gonna tell me it's because of the planning. Um, and I have another question about planning that I'll come back to, but I just wanted to start with that question. Sure, Steve Kaiser, Planning and Zoning. I can at least start to answer it. Um, what we find, we were often incorrect historically in assessing how much actual development re review work we were doing. So the numbers, the further back we go, I think get fuzzier for me as I've looked into things. I would say that the work that we're doing now is more complicated than it was five years ago. So when we say um, number of site development plan applications, what you don't know is how many reviews they go through. You don't know how many mods are associated with that or the challenges you have a, an angry developer or citizens opposed. Projects seem to be more complicated to process today than they were even two years ago. If you ask my staff, um, they, they feel they've never worked harder, although the actual number of applications may have gone down, the number of reviews has probably gone up. And you're right, I would say much of the increase that we've had is due to adding other positions not related to development review, because as you know, we, you know, we did a, a GDP uh, that was an enormous work of effort. We are now, you know, starting the first three of nine region plans. We did the Glen Burnie plan. We're working on two town center plans, uh, fiscal impact analysis, uh, uh, impact fee update. We're working on school APF work groups. Um, when you look at the amount of planning work we're doing that's not directly related to development review today versus five years or 10 years ago, there's an astronomical increase in the metrics. So that would, that would be my, my response. And I understand your question. And I wish, I wish we had a way with development review metrics. We've, we've talked about it. How do we capture how difficult this review is as opposed to a static number that there's an application? So that's how I would respond to that. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Pickard. Sorry, I just left my hand up, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Vilke, did you have a follow-up? You're on mute, yes, go ahead. I did. Thank you. Um, so my next question, because I, I assume there might be something about the planning and how much is being done. Am I to understand from the slideshow that you did that there is, um, I don't know if it's an expansion of adequate public facilities or not, but is that going to be something that you're looking at to include an analysis of the impact of new development on libraries and recreation and parks amenities? Is that something you're looking at adding to the APF criteria? Or is that just something you're looking at in terms of whether um, you know, there's gonna be an impact? Because if you're talking about impact fees, I'm assuming that's gonna be tied to APF. So um, when I, the way I would respond to that is that we need to be updating our adequate public facilities laws um, on, a, on a more regular schedule. And we have not done that in the past and we need to do that, that requires resources. But I would say the, um, the specific issue with libraries and parks and rec is only related to the, an impact fee study as to whether or not we should be charging, one, can we legally charge and two, would we want to charge impact fees for those um, capital facilities to support those operations? They're not directly tied to APF. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Fiedler, District 5. So I'm gonna piggyback onto that. So my, I guess my understanding from this conversation is that you have two things going on in OPZ. You have the development review, but then you also have the initiatives that are, are 
in process or going to be in process. So my, my question is related to the APFO and expanding and updating on a regular basis. Is that initiative, and I, I do understand that we need to update on a more regular basis, but it, does that put the um, department in a position where they're, again, taking on more than what you can handle with the positions that you have? And will that, you know, be a negative impact on development review? Because what I'm, what I'm hearing is if, even if it's a, a small development review process um, on an already established single family lot, it's taking a long time to get turnaround. So I just want to understand and, and feel comfortable that any new initiatives, your staff has the ability to do it all. So um, Steve Kai Ziegler, Planning and Zoning Officer, what I would say is, as everyone knows, we're engaged in a fairly long um, effort with a work group dealing with school APF. Public Works is leading a companion effort on transportation APF. We need to get our APF straightened out in the next couple of years. And then what we need to be planning for is updating that five years, whatever time period we pick into the future. So that, that isn't a necessary thing now, but we, as planners, we try and look ahead. I don't see any connection with that work and what we do in development review though, in the sense of, is it taking or adding resources away from uh, one place to another? And, and I'd also say is we've really only touched on two areas in this discussion about what our office does, which is development review and long range planning. There are significant efforts underway in cultural resources and what our, our GIS folks do, if you recall the work with the, um, the redistricting committee and making maps and participating in that effort. And that, that, you know, that was Mark Burt and Christina Pompa and myself, but the map making was all through GIS. And we're also finding is, um, you know, we live in a, a different world today on the zoning side, the, the complaints that are coming in about what someone is doing um, require enormous resources to investigate. And that's one of the reasons where we've asked and the administration has been willing to support positions in that group. We don't do enforcement unless we have a complaint. If, if we did, if we tried to take on everything we saw, we would need a staff 10 times the size of what we have. We're limited to complaints because of the resource issue. Thank I hope you. that answered your question. It does, thank you. All right, um, thank you very much, Mr. Kai Ziegler. I don't see any additional questions from my colleagues. Uh, we've got, appreciate the helpful information you provided today. Um, and at this time, um, we will be moving on to um, the solid waste um, budget, the operating side, and it will be led by Mr. Chris Phipps. Thank along you for having with, us. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we will also have along with uh, Chris Phipps, Karen Henry, Rody Holthouse, Noel Anuskiewicz, Anuskiewicz, um, Kim Clooney, Alex Bakie, and Beth O'Connell. And Thank you may you. begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> this is Chris Phipps, the Director of Public Works. And uh, good morning, Council Chair Rodman and members of the County Council. I'm, I'm pleased to present to you briefly the FY23 operating budget proposal for the Department of Public Works. First of all, I would I wanted to thank you for all of your support over the last two years as we have endured the grips of the COVID-19 pandemic and the pressures it has placed on all of us. As you know, the clock does not stop for DPW. We must continue to de deliver service 24-7, 365 to deliver safe and reliable drinking water, discharge clean treated wastewater, maintain safe and reliable travel ways, ensure efficient and responsive waste collection and recycling, and restore our watersheds and floodplains. And all these programs are heavily regulated in one way or another, and did, we did not experience any curtailment or relaxation of regulatory requirements. Yet, as you know, none of these responsibilities could be accomplished remotely or through telework. Our frontline workers were there every day, vulnerable to the threats of the pandemic, delivering these essential services to the public unrelentlessly. And throw in a tornado, eight winter storms, supply chain issues, driver shortages, and other external challenges, it's been a tough couple of years to continue delivering service at the levels we are accustomed to and that the public expects. Despite all these challenges, in addition to providing the essential services noted above, we have also been able to open a new cell at the landfill, resurfaced 135 lane miles of roadway, 
submit our ADA transition plan to MDOT, implement a new 5G ADL system for snowplow tracking, win the Water Environment Federation's Best Program Management and Innovation Award for our watershed program, awarded the National Association of Clean Water Agencies gold awards for six of our water reclamation facilities, and deliver projects including the Broadneck Trail, Solly Cove Boat Ramp, Eisenhower Golf Course, Randazzo Athletic Fields, Downs Park Amphitheater, and near completion of the Glen Burnie Park Road and Sidewalk Reconstruction, just to name a few. Looking forward to this next fiscal year, we are committed to continued excellent service delivery while tightening our belts to minimize any upward pressure on our rates. You will see that we are not requesting any increased rates to our watershed protection and restoration fee, nor to our solid waste fee. However, for the first time in the last four years, and only the second time in the last 10 years, we are requesting an increase in water and sewage uh, sewer usage rates. Nevertheless, as you will see in our presentation later, our request is well below the measured rate of inflation within the, and within the codified limit of 5%, and still near the lowest rates in the region. And finally, we are not requesting any new positions in this year's budget for any of the five bureaus. So with that, we can, we'll turn to the budget book, page 204, and walk through our proposed budget. So the first page 204, um, just highlighting some of the uh, accomplishments and objectives for this coming fiscal year. Next page 205, um, essentially showing all of our uh, budget across the entire department, you'll see we're requesting $323,106,000 for FY23 overall, uh, which represents an increase of 5.4%. And you can see each of the funds, uh, how, how it all breaks out. <clears throat> Next page 206, uh, you'll see a, a summary of our uh, bureaus and the relative uh, position classification numbers. And you'll see that we are requesting no new uh, positions. We did do a little transfer. We took two positions out of highways, GIS positions, and re, uh, repositioned them in engineering. <clears throat> Other than that, there's no, no change. And so we'll, going on to page 207, we'll, we'll go through each of the um, bureaus. We have the, the director's office. Most, most of the change there is due to the personal services um, changes. The Bureau of Engineering, um, you'll see on page 208, um, most of the increase here is personal services and the transfer of the, the two position, GIS positions from highways into engineering. We also are requesting adi some additional survey equipment, basically two mapping grade GPS receivers and a data collector. Page 209, uh, Bureau of Highways. You'll see um, most of the changes here are uh, reflective of the personal services uh, adjustment. And we are requesting additional um, contractual services funds. This would be to complete a Vision Zero study um, as mandated by the state. And we're also uh, pursuing a congestion relief study uh, along some of our key corridors, key roadways, and some additional tree removal services. The next uh, page, 210, is our water and wastewater operations. And you'll see we did, we do have some significant increases associated with contractual services. A lot of that is for our biosolids uh, handling and um, roadway permanent patch uh, for, for pavement repair. And also uh, in supplies and materials, we have increases in chemicals and equipment repair parts. Um, I've got a separate slide that I'm gonna, or a separate um, presentation I'm gonna show since it, for water and wastewater as we are requesting additional um, rates this year. Page 211 just shows our finance and administration office, which is really where the debt service um, goes or is funded. And um, most of the increase in this particular case is for uh, debt service. So um, can we pull up the PowerPoint I have for the rates?
Thank you. So um, I just wanted to take a, a moment to walk through briefly uh, utility rates, just so you get an understanding of uh, what's driving and what the outcome here is. So the need for the rate increase, so it's specifically 4.95% for water and 4.83% for sewer, are to cover increases that we're seeing in our biosolids handling facilities. So that was a 16% rate increase and also chemical costs, uh, which across the board, you know, um, chlorine, ferric chloride, um, sodium hypochlorite, all kinds of materials uh, and chemical costs are going up. Um, also, CPI increase uh, in FY23 is much higher than we've seen uh, in previous years. And that pretty much hits all the goods and contracts um, that we uh, provide. And then also, we, we had uh, 9.5 million total in AR, ARPA funding that is not available this year. So um, we have to cover that gap as well. Next slide. And this, this slide shows the, um, the fund balance that we have available and the way we, our metric as codified is two months of operating expenses. And a month of operating expense is about $20 million. So, um, I'm sorry, $10 million. So two months is $20 million. And that's tracking the red line there. So trying to stay uh, tracked with that red line, even though FY22, we, have a, we do have a fund balance, we're in a structural deficit where we're spending more than our budget is uh, revenues are bringing in. So to correct that imbalance, uh, we're requesting the roughly 5% increase in FY23, which results in a $39.65 increase uh, on the annual bill. Next slide. And if you look at historically uh, where we've been, as I mentioned, uh, we've only had two rate increases uh, in the last 10 years. Um, this will be the third in year 11. Um, and we're still, if you do the, uh, you can see it's the same math as I showed before. So the quarterly cost is going up about $10 um, on the average customer. Next slide. And this slide just shows uh, where we rank in our water, even with this FY23 uh, budget, where we rank relative to our neighbors uh, in the water and sewer usage fees, um, pretty much at the low end, <clears throat> at the low end, quite frankly. Next slide. <clears throat> now I'm ro rolling into the trans uh, transitioning into the debt service fund which is supported, um, and that's on the right-hand side of the slide there, that's supported through two revenue sources. One is the, what we call EPF, Environmental Protection Fee, which is a surcharge on the water and sewer usage rates. In this case, it consistent with code, it's a 35% um, surcharge. That revenue goes toward debt service on replacing, repairing, or, or rehabilitating existing infrastructure. So the current rate payers are paying to rebuild the existing uh, infrastructure. The capital facility connection charge uh, is the 10,286 per, per water and sewer goes towards the debt service for system expansion and growth. Next slide. And similar to the um, chart on the operating fund, we have to main, we maintain a, it's not codified, but best practices suggest that we maintain a two-year debt service uh, balance in our uh, fund balance, which translates to about, we're spending about 75, 75 million a year in debt service. So two years is 150 million. So that's about where that white line is through the chart. And again, we do have a fund balance above that, but we're in a um, structural deficit as well. So um, the chart below shows that uh, we're, while we're requesting an F, an FY23, an increase, we use a rate model to predict what the future rate increases need to be to, to service the debt that we have and project to have. And you can see there, um, we don't anticipate the need for any additional capital facility connection charge um, increases for the foreseeable future. 
we review this every year. So um, it is always subject to change, but for now, it looks like we'll be in fairly good shape. There is a dip you'll see um, in FY 26, 27, but it's too soon right now to try to adjust and correct for that. Um, as we approach it, we'll, we'll uh, react accordingly, but it's not a significant dip. Next slide. And uh, similar to the operating usage fee chart, this is a, a chart that shows the water and sewer capital facility connection charges and where we rank. And you will notice we are a little bit higher. We're on the high end here. And this is a symptom of um, Anne Arundel County does the way our debt service and our usage rate funds work. We shield um, the existing rate payer from the costs of new uh, growth and new connections. So um, many of the other jurisdictions don't, they have a universal fee. For instance, Howard County, when you look at where they are, um, they apply an 8% ad valorem on their property tax. That 8%, the revenue from that 8% ad valorem goes into their utility fund and they can use it for whatever um, is required, whether it's operating and maintenance or debt service. So, um, and again, as we know, um, if, if you apply an ad valorem to a, to a property tax bill, it will uh, automatically increase year over year because assessed value of property goes up. Anytime we need to uh, cor correct our revenue picture, we have to force a rate change. We don't get the value of a year over year assessable rate increase. So um, I believe that's the last slide I had on the, um, on the rates. And before, I mean, before we take questions, we, we've got two more funds I wanted to get to. The, um, that would be the, the uh, solid waste fund. And uh, as, as, I as I mentioned, um, we have no rate increases uh, projected or proposed for solid waste. However, we are seeing increased um, costs. We've got four, We've opened three new bids on uh, curbside collection contracts, and we have one more to go. And we are, uh, we've had to make corrections. Um, they're about a million dollars increase per uh, contract. So they're, we're seeing significant increases in curbside collection. Um, we're also seeing increases in our out-of-county out of disposal rates and um, recycling, uh, processing recycling. The cost of that is, is increasing as well. Um, next slide is watershed protection and restoration. And we're, we are proposing no rate increase here. And the only increases are, are really subject to the um, personal services adjustments and debt service um, as we continue to build new projects and, and incur new debt. So with that, um, that completes the presentation we're available to take any questions. Mr. Pruski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Chris and the whole team. I uh, appreciate you. I wanna give a compliment and then I have a question. Um, I wanna thank you for the partnership uh, with the state of Maryland for the durable medical equipment. Um, I know uh, some counties in Virginia that have been doing that for a while and uh, that's actually a great idea. And I know people that have used it because uh, as you drive through Millersville around the loop, uh, there are people uh, especially that utilize equipment and then throw it out um, or, or you know, don't know where to discard it. So I, I want to thank you all for taking some leadership on that. Uh, anything we can remove from our stream uh, is going to be helpful. So thank you for that. Um, speaking of stream, though, you know that I've been a big advocate in this council passed a resolution about organics recycling. The Jessup facility, uh, that's a commercial facility, is, is obviously expanding, coming online but I wanted to check with you if there were any additional conversations in regards to uh, any additional regional approach or the state uh, to expand that service. Again, you know, there's some benefits to that. I understand that some of the stream goes into our, uh, our own sewer system and things like that, but I just didn't know if you had any updates or uh, people are further talking maybe about partnering with Jessup or with the private sector. So I was just curious if you had any comments. Thank you. Yes, uh, Chris Phipps, Director of Public Works. Um, Thanks for that question. We, we toured the facility um, uh, last year, I guess it was in the fall sometime, and they, they are um, in need of about, I think they're at 70% capacity. 
with the available food processing facilities they have in the Chesapeake area. So they're looking for another 30%. Um, and what, what they were pursuing perhaps was to, to, to first perhaps seek that source from the institutional um, market. Are there, you know, big users or, you know, food processing um, uh, opportunities perhaps at, you know, Arundel Mills, the airport, um, the Naval Academy, places where large amounts are generated that could easily be transported and um, utilized in their anaerobic digesters. After that, then they'd start, you know, getting further into, are there more commercial opportunities, shopping centers and things like that? And then, you know, obviously, um, I think the, the third uh, opportunity, which is, would be further down the road, would be, you know, residential curbside collection. Now, that is going to be a whole different ball game in the amount of, you know, what we're seeing already with curbside collection contracts is, is huge. It's, it's our biggest expense in um, the waste management uh, budget. So I, I think it, before we go there, we need to see, um, you know, have they been able to capture the low-hanging fruit and then uh, go further upstream, which is curbside collection of residential. We're actually in our um, capital budget, you, you know, and you'll, you'll hear later, one, we do have a, we were requesting some funding to do a study in-house um, of what what could we do to expand, increase our um, organics recycling, food processing? First, we'd have to modify our landfill to be a tier two uh, facility, organics facility. It's not currently um, permitted for that. So there would need to be some construction. And then the next thing would be, what would it cost to, to add a fourth collection to our service? So we're exploring this. You know, I'm not saying we're doing it, but we need to, first, before we can even have the discussion, we want to see what the, what the overall costs and needs would be to, to accommodate such a thing. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, first, Mr. Phipps, I want to say thank you, a huge thank you. And um, obviously that tornado came right through Edgewater and you and I spoke immediately. I also spoke with Office of Emergency Management, getting those dumpsters out that you all helped with uh, was huge for the folks in District 7. So a huge thank you to that for all your help uh, with the tornado for the District 7 residents. Um, on the budget piece, two quick questions. One, why are we changing the two employees? Why are, why are we moving them? What's the rationale behind that? Um, and then on the capital connection charges, given that you, it looks like you're only trying to do the rate increase once, did you look at phasing it or doing it later or, or doing a piece now and a piece later? How does that modeling work out? First, um, Chris Phipps, Director of Public Works. Um, on the two GIS positions, we did it for efficiency because we already have GIS, a, a, a very robust GIS group in our engineering uh, bureau, which handles water and sewer, uh, solid waste. So it made sense for us to just transfer, transition the two that were in highways into that group for economies of scale and better efficiency. Um, regarding the uh, capital facility connection charge, I, it's already codified. So it's, we're not increasing it um, per se. It's in code that it's already established. Those rates are to be um, set. The other thing I would say is we see a dip coming. So I think it would only um, deepen that dip if we don't hold the rates that, that are already in code for FY23. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. Mr. Phipps, thank you for that presentation. And I, too, have some appreciation to share. Um, yesterday, I or two days ago, I reached out to your department about a tree over College Parkway. Within 24 hours, crews were out there taking that tree that was hanging precariously over the roadway down. Um, and just to Mr. Flores, who continually works, and, and Mr. Tabachak with road issues and safety in the district, I sincerely appreciate their efforts and your support of that team. Um, my question is regarding contractual services. I know um, there was some federal funds used for um, pickup. Is that included in this budget or is that completely eliminated, the federal funding? 
So when you say federal funding for pickup, I'm, roadside for uh, trash collection, I know. I believe we used some federal funds to add a, a contractual service provider. Am I getting that wrong? Um, I'm I'm not familiar with that. Let me. Um, hey, Chris Phipps, I'm I'm happy. Or Rody, whichever. <laughs> You can oh. see the, the ARPA so, funds for the not litter. Okay, not litter. Okay, I, I, yeah, you're talking about curbside collection of, of um, yard waste and in some cases recycling. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we had yeah that was a um, that was using the ARPA funding from last year to fill in a gap where one of our contractors was non-responsive, was not providing the service. And one of the last things, you know, one of the cornerstones of public works is picking up the trash, picking up the recycling, picking up the yard waste. And we can't, we can't miss a day, miss a week, miss a month. It just will stack up. So we had to take on emergency service contract to continue that service unimpeded for the, the citizens, uh, you know, of the county. So we did do that and we're in, um, you know, we're in negotiations and discussions with that contractor um, uh, and the law office. So I'm really not at liberty to discuss the, the contractor who was not performing. Understood. So that that was, it sounds like a unique situation and that perhaps emergency funding will not be needed in the future pending contract negotiations. Our hope is that, yes, our goal is to get out of the contract uh, emergency contract situation. And a lot of this is um, resetting, you know, we are with the four new bids um, and others that are coming. Uh, we, we anticipate that some of this market fluctuation and correction will, will stabilize things. That's our, that's our goal. Um, and our goal is not to request new uh, use of ARPA funds to fill gaps. Thank you. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair, Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, Mr. Phipps, on page three of the PowerPoint presentation that you did, looking at the utility fund user rates, it looks to me like the projection in the next three fiscal years is that the average annual bill is going to increase based on this modeling $160 for Anne Arundel County families. Is that the modeling that you're seeing too, and is there any way to mitigate that in terms of how much that's going to go up on people in a short period of time? Chris Phipps, Director of Public Works. That is what we're seeing. Um, if we project uh, 24, 25, 26, and maintain the fund balance that uh, we're obligated to maintain, um, you know, I, I, I always uh, shudder when you know I'm trying. You, we'll, we'll be at at this time next year for FY24, will it be $64.58? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna do everything I can as we have over the last 11 years to contain that rate increase. Um, that's, that's my commitment. Thank you. All right, at this time, I see no additional questions. Um, uh, let's see, what is next on our agenda? Mr. Phipps, we have more from you, yes? Yeah, I think we roll into capital. Budget. All right, um, in that case, that sounds great. Let's roll into capital. Office of Budget. Um, I would like to take just a couple moments to present to you all two new capital projects in the general county class. Uh, the first being on page 28 of your uh, large capital budget book. <clears throat> uh, the first one is YWCA Trafficking Safe House. Uh, this capital project will provide county assistance uh, toward the construction and expansion of a residential facility that will uh, provide refuge for exploited youths uh, between the ages of 13 and 24. Um, and they are requesting $500,000 uh, in fiscal year 23. Um, the second capital project, which is on page 29 of your capital budget book, is the Children's Theater of Annapolis. Uh, and this capital uh, project will provide county assistance toward the rehabilitation and expansion um, of their annex building. So um, they're requesting uh, $300,000 in fiscal year 23. Um, and at this time, I'd like to take any questions you may have. 
Okay, great. Um, I guess at this point, I would like to turn it back over to Chris Phipps, uh, the director of DPW, to get you started on uh, their capital projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. McAllister. Okay, um, Chris Phipps, director of Public Works, and I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to uh, David Braun and um, the team, which will include Alex Bakier, Beth O'Connell, and eventually Chris Murphy to go through each of the classes. I believe we start with this um, C class. We have a couple of uh, public works projects in the C class. Naomi, um, can you provide the page or David um, page number? I can do that as well, David. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Alex Bakier, Deputy Director, Bureau of Highways. I'd like to uh, highlight two C-class projects, if I may. And if we can bring up the uh, PDF, uh, we'll start out with the additional salt storage capacity for slide. And uh, if I can draw your attention to page 15A in the, uh, the capital program. Um, to summarize, uh, the Bureau of Highways has a current storage capacity of about 4.25 tons per lane mile, and our county roadway mileage increases yearly uh, with the county uh, trying to maintain a goal of uh, a storage capacity of five tons per lane mile. We accomplish this as part of program replacement of existing salt storage facilities at the end of their service lives. The requested increase is due to current cost estimates and fiscal analysis. Prior funding has uh, us moving forward on Dover Road at the northern point of the county. FY23 funding allows us to move forward with Davidsonville off uh, Maryland 214 with the conclusion of this uh, multi-year project in FY24 with an expanded re uh, replacement of an existing barn of a larger size at the southernmost part of the county in Friendship. Next uh, slide, please. This is, if I may bring your attention to page 23, the West County Road Operations Yard. This is a project to replace and relocate a circa 1950s Odenton Yard due to functional obsolescence, incompatibility with the surrounding residential area and the Odenton Town Center transit oriented development. Uh, the requested increase is due, due to current cost estimates at the conclusion of the schematic design phase. And on the screen, you can see to the left, an aerial view of the existing Odenton Yard facility uh, nestled in there uh, just behind the current volunteer fire station and adjacent to the transit oriented develop residential development that is uh, just to its east. And on the left portion, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the right portion of the slide, you'll see a schematic design for the new facility co-located at the Millsville landfill um, and just uh, adjacent to the existing administration building and uh, to the south of the current uh, uh, convenience center. And that concludes the two uh, highlights that we have within the C-class and that will bring us to the H-class portion uh, of our presentation. Uh, I say go ahead and uh, continue on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I believe I have a preceding slide in the deck. Um, nope, I do not. Okay, we'll start with Outing Avenue then. Uh, this being page 180, A and B. To summarize, Outing Avenue uh, is a project to design and construct new retaining walls along the approach road to the Greenhaven Wharf which is being renovated under a separate recreations and parks project. FY23 has a request for design with the balance of the project funded in FY24. Uh, and you can see on the slide, we have uh, retaining walls that are quite old, legacy features. There's a mix of materials uh, that uh, along a number of segments of the approach road and in order to maintain this one way in, one way out and keep it viable. Uh, this project's to correct and uh, replace the retaining walls. And that brings us to the pavement management program, which includes four capital projects that fund the roadway pavement improvements throughout the county, inclusive of alleys. 
you'll notice uh, there's no, it's per plan for the Rundle Mills uh, LDC, but for road resurfacing, road reconstruction and alley reconstruction, I'll handle those as a group. There are uh, requested increases in uh, above the FY22 appropriations as a result of inflation and implementation of prevailing wage legislation. I'll also note that uh, the current funding level uh, allows us, uh, based on modeling, to maintain stasis, where we are able to maintain the overall network uh, condition and a rating in the area of 77 or 76 uh, uh, for our payment condition index, which is a, a good indicator of overall uh, payment uh, quality. We still continue to work away at a current backlog of approximately 102. 152 million, and some of that uh, funding will go to reducing the backlog, primarily utilizing the road reconstruction uh, project funding. At the bottom most portion of the slide, just some reference met met uh, metrics relative to the size of the county network. Okay, and that concludes the pavement management program and our highlight slides. And uh, David, in terms of following the order, I think I may turn it back to you for uh, uh, you to uh, carry on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, David Braun, uh, Engineer Administrator with the Department of Public Works Bureau of Engineering. Um, the Bureau of Engineering's projects in the H class begin on page 134 with the Major Bridge uh, Rehab multi-year project. Um, and uh, that is basically just uh, uh, following per plan uh, for that. Um, next is the Highway Safety Improvement Project, which is on page 135. That's also a multi-year project moving by plan. Uh, Alex, we, did you already cover the masonry reconstruction one? Thank you, David. Um, I should highlight just masonry construction um, has a uh, increase requested in FY23 as a result of inflation and implementation of prevailing wage. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, the moving back to the ridge projects then on page 139, the Magnathy Bridge Road. We have an increase based on escalation and uh, current cost estimates. That project actually will be going out to bid here shortly, uh, pending just one more permit uh, that we need to get for that. Um, Harwood Road Bridge over Stockett's Run on page 140 um, also is a uh, increase due to the uh, current cost estimate. And the fiscal analysis based on that, that project is ad advertised now, and we will be receiving bids um, uh, by the end of the, this month on that. Um, the Furnace Avenue Bridge over Deep Run on page 141, uh, working through the design phase, and we have uh, updated estimates for the design cost and the right of way cost uh, for the re uh, increased funding in FY23. I'm uh, moving forward, page 145, the Pulling House Road Bridge over Rock Branch, uh, a small increase for um, escalation on those contracts. And moving on to page 150 is the Rundle Mills LDC Roads project, uh, which is uh, proceeding uh, per plan, uh, no change. Uh, next is ADA right-of-way compliance. Which does have an increase as a result of uh, inflation and implementation of prevailing wage. And that is on page 151. And then on uh, page 153, uh, is the McKendry Road uh, culvert over Lyons Creek. Um, small increase for um, escalation on that project. Next, I'll highlight alley reconstruction, which is page 159. Project is, uh, in summary, reconstruction rehabilitation of county-owned alleys and related ancillary work. 
This is reflecting an increase in FY23 and what throughout uh, the program as a relation of increased inflationary costs and implementation of prevailing wage. In the Hanover Road Bridge over Deep Run, page 165, um, cost adjustments for um, escalation on the design contract there. That's actually the same as you'll see on the next two projects, Conway Road over Little Patuxent River, page 166, and Jacobs Road over Severn Run, uh, page 167. And then the bridge program management uh, project on page 175 is a multi-year that we've started this year. We're in the process of hiring the consultant for that now. Uh, that is continuing for plan. We have Oakwood Road and the Old Mill Boulevard Roundabout Project on page 177. There is an increase uh, in FY23 um, requested due to updated cost estimates and the need to uh, address deficient roadway drainage at the Cherry Road intersection. There is a, a, a small uh, FY23 funding uh, for right-of-way acquisition with the balance of the project in FY24. Uh, next, we have Pleasant Plains Road safety improvements on page 177. And that uh, increase reflected in FY23 um, and 24 are due to updated cost estimates. Um, uh, and next, Outing Avenue, which we touched on in our highlight slides, I'll just say uh, again is a new project. And uh, you'll see the uh, initial programming in FY23 with the balance in 24. And David, yeah. I think so that, that includes my projects and-, and uh, that, that is the list of our projects in the H class. If we wanna do the traffic control quickly for the H2 class, Alex. You have that. Certainly, uh, I can touch on that. Um, the projects within traffic control start with guardrail. I do not have that page number. Uh, it's page 199. Thank you, 199, uh, which has a small adjustment uh, in FY23 and throughout plan uh, as a relate of, uh, in, in response to inflation. The balance of projects um, are per plan that uh, includes traffic signal modifications, new traffic signals, neighborhood traffic control, new street lighting, street light conversion, street light pole replacement, developer street lights. Uh, no change throughout the, the, the uh, six year plan. Uh, Madam Chair, well, that should be the end of our uh, roads, bridges and traffic uh, projects presentation. Thank you very much. I do see a couple questions and I believe Mr. Volke was first. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, how much did, did the Department of Public Works add to each project uh, as a result of Bill 7221, the prevailing wage legislation? How much did that take up the costs? Um, what we did was uh, did, did some research on what other uh, experience was through the state to kind of look at um, what the impact can be estimated to be. And what we did was take the project construction costs for those projects that were be um, impacted by the bill and, and added 7% to the construction cost. So it's not 7% across the whole project, just to the construction cost. May I ask a quick follow-up, Madam Chair? Thank you, Mr. Braun. So with that, in terms of how much it actually increased the CIP then, or the request that you have in front of us, do you have that number as to what 7% on top of the construction cost was? I, I actually have it on, uh, on the individual projects, but I don't have a total. I should have done that. I can get that for you. Thank you. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Feather, District 5. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I have two questions on, the first question is on the Pleasant Plains Road um, project. 
Does that cost for FY23 include the moving of polls, BGE polls? I know that's been a, I know right of way was part of the acquisition and, and funding necessity, but is the actual moving of the polls included? Um, let me, it is included in the project. I'm trying to check to make sure it was in 23 or 24 based on the timing right now. Okay. Um, and, and if you need to get back to me. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll confirm that. Uh, I, I know it's in the total project cost. I'll confirm what year we have the, the BGE cost in there. Perfect. Thank you. Madam Chair, may I ask one more question? Go ahead. Um, sidewalks. Um, I went through the index and I did not notice um, shore acres on there. Last year, I had reached out inquiring about a uh, shore acres sidewalk and they, they were listed as future years in our future year being this year during the PAB um, meeting, but I do not see shore acres in the sidewalk project category. Are they in there and I'm just missing or are they bumped another year? Um. It is on the priority list that we received. Um, we've been coordinating between two different lists, one we get from the Office of Transportation and one we get from uh, public schools. So there might have been a, a mix up in pulling the list together and how we put that together for the appendix. But I know that it is in there in the, in, in the, the plan for both of those to be looked at, yes. Okay, I'll follow up separately, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, following up again on the Outing Avenue retaining walls, which I know probably doesn't get anybody excited except me, um, but I did promise the community that I would ask, is there any way if you all had the funding in this budget that you could do the work sooner? Or is this one of these situations where it's gonna take time for design and then follow up? And, and so there's really nothing more you could do in this fiscal year. I'd be happy to start with that, and then David can can uh, continue uh, with his thoughts. But uh, I, to be honest, I think that project will take some time. Uh, we need to start with survey and establish the location of the role, uh, the the current retaining walls relative to the road right of way and private property. So, really, out of the gate, I would say that's our first part uh, of the exercise, and that will take some time. And likely, that means we're going to have some land acquisition. Uh, involved. Um, and that just takes uh, a bit of time to accomplish. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Ms. Hare, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair, Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, I'm just wondering if we could get a quick status on um, the 214 widening and I I know we were doing right away acquisition and things like that. How's it going? Um, we have the agreement with SHA who is actually managing the design and they've started the design now. Um, we're working with them to both identify the specifics of that design and seeing how much of that we can kind of move forward quicker. Um, you know, if we can identify right away, can we start working on that before the full design is going? Um, they're also still in the process of uh, pulling better numbers together on um, the possibility of undergrounding the utilities through the area. Um, so they're still they're working on a lot of those uh, preliminary things, but we are making progress now um, and and so so far are on our original schedule. Awesome. You anticipated my question perfectly yeah. on the underground utilities yeah. and burying those. So that's great. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I seeing, I don't see any additional hands. All right, I believe we are ready to move on. Let's see, where are we again? What, what's next? Um, uh, stormwater management, I believe, is that correct? Correct. Yes, Ms. Is, um, yeah. okay, this is, this is Chris you may Phipps proceed. Again. Yeah, Chris Phipps again. I'm gonna um, hand it over to Eric Michelson to walk through the, what we call B-class projects for the watershed restoration protection fund. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, Eric Michelson, Deputy Director, Bureau of Watershed Protection and Restoration. Um, if the uh, PDF, yeah, great. Thank you. 
So we've got several new projects in the uh, the budget this year. Uh, I think a number of these should be uh, familiar to the uh, several council members. This is um, Long Point Living Shoreline. This is uh, the tip peninsula of South River Farm Park, uh, basically at the mouth of Selby Bay. We've been talking with Councilwoman Hare about this one for a bit, as well as the community uh, residents. Uh, this is a, a piece of land uh, that protects Selby Bay. Um, and extends off the park uh, and has begun some fairly rapid erosion. We have been working with the Arundel Rivers Federation, as well as the community association itself, uh, to uh, discuss options for protecting and preserving uh, and restoring this peninsula uh, as part of the park. And so as part of this request, uh, we've got design funding in the FY23 budget of $400,000. Uh, again, like I say, the, the goals of this project are both to protect county parkland uh, and the area of Selby Bay behind, as well as to uh, provide nutrient and sediment reductions to the South River in this case. Next slide. Uh, Lake Marion uh, outfall construction. This is a project, again, that uh, Councilwoman Lacey is familiar with. It's in the province. province eh provinces community in Severn. Uh, it is an area where the community actually owns the, um, the lake itself, which is an amenity lake, uh, but the county is responsible for the uh, outfall, which is a uh, old concrete trapezoidal channel that was installed and is failing at this point. Uh, the community actually has pursued and received uh, grant funding from the LDC uh, and has a design and basically permits in place. And so this money is for the construction of uh, that outfall rehabilitation associated with this work. Uh, the community is also interested in some dredging of the lake. And so we're continuing to work with them as well on pursuing uh, funding from the Department of Natural Resources and others um, on, on that. The LDC has been very supportive of this project overall. So this funding is a $1.5 million request for the construction of that outfall uh, that will provide uh, water quality benefits downstream as well as repair the existing infrastructure. Next slide. Uh, this, the next three projects are actually um, sort of, uh, intended to help us pursue compliance with uh, the current permit we were issued, our current stormwater permit that we were issued in November of 2021. Uh, this uh, project is to do design for several tributaries coming into Lake Waterford. Uh, you may be aware that there has been, there have been sedimentation issues with the lake. Um, over the course of the past several decades. And so the idea here is that through undertaking this stream and wetland restoration in the tributaries above the lake that we can arrest uh, or slow the sedimentation of the lake itself, provide um, water quality benefits above the lake, uh, and then also reduce dredging costs into the future. So this is a request for design funding uh, for the stream and, and wetland uh, restoration work associated with that. Next slide. Um, next, this is the Middle Patuxent tributaries, so the area um, in the vicinity of Odenton, Crofton, um, essentially for stream and re wetland restoration work in that area to help us satisfy our permit uh, reduction goals. Uh, we have uh, really focused with both this project and the next project in the Patuxent watershed where we are aiming to get some increased uh, nutrient and sediment reductions over the course of the next several years. A lot of the focus uh, up to this point has been on the eastern side of the county, uh, Magathy, Severn, Patapsco, um, south. And so this is uh, the beginning of additional work in the Patuxent tributaries. Next slide, please. Upper Patuxent tributaries. Um, again, this is uh, same, uh, same idea as the, uh, the prior, just a different area. This is up uh, closer towards uh, the airport. Um, and again, stream and wetland restoration design um, in those tributaries for identified reaches where we've uh, seen high levels of erosion and change over time uh, to help us satisfy our MS4 and TMDL goals. Uh, next slide. I think that's the end of my slides, actually. Um, so that I'll go through the um, existing projects where there has uh, there is some additional request in the FY23 budget um, and uh, take those case by case. Um, B5516 uh, 
it, our culvert enclosed storm drain rehab project, which is on page 420. Um, this is a request as program, $5.1 million for uh, extending the useful life and enhancing uh, that infrastructure. Uh, B5517, which is page 421A, our emergency storm drain uh, request is uh, as program $2.3 million. And again, this is to extend the useful life of that infrastructure. Both of these projects are used by our stormwater infrastructure protection staff to address uh, those ongoing uh, infrastructure issues. Next project is B5522, Magathy River Stream 03. This is Mill Creek um, in the area around uh, Arnold and Annapolis, page 424A. This is a uh, $2 million request for construction um, uh, based on engineers' cost estimates. Next uh, project is B5538, uh, Patapsco Title Outfalls 03. This is for Rock Creek construction, $2 million. This is actually recognizing a federal earmark that we received for, uh, for that work. Uh, page, that's page 430A. Uh, B553900, Patapsco Title Stream 03. This is Furnace Creek. Uh, it's page 431A. Uh, it's $100,000 for some adaptive management work associated with that project. B5541, Patapsco Title uh, outfall 04. This is Back Creek uh, up in the Glen Burnie area, page 432A. It's $975,000 for construction uh, phase work. B5443, excuse me, B5543, Patapsco Tidal Stream 04. Uh, this is uh, for Marley Creek Green Branch um, uh, in the area uh, of uh, uh, Millersville. Uh, for page 433A, uh, $50,000 for uh, construction associated work. B5578, Severn River Stream 02. This is Picture Spring Branch in the area around Odenton, page 438A, $500,000 for construction phase services. Uh, B5591, uh, South River Stream 01, Susan's Branch West in the area around Annapolis. Page 439A, this is $329,000 for construction uh, phase services. B5597, South River Stream 04, uh, Glee Branch Construction, uh, 40, excuse me, 442A. Um, this is $2.27 million for construction. A, a large uh, portion of this is actually SHA transportation enhancement money uh, grant that we received for that project. Uh, B5611, um, WPRP restoration grant. This is a $1 million request um, for uh, additional funding for our restoration grant program that we run through the Chesapeake Bay Trust. That's page 446A. Uh, B5683, public-private performance of water quality improvements. This is $2 million uh, to continue that program. This is page 444A. Uh, we just actually received word earlier this week that we received a uh, National Association of Counties uh, award for that program um, for the efficiencies and uh, cost savings that it creates. So really proud of that. Uh, B5717, South River Outfalls. Uh, Broad Creek, this is basically $50,000 for uh, adaptive management of uh, a project associated with that um, account. That's page 40, excuse me, 449A. And then finally, uh, Clark Station Road drainage improvements. This is page 452A. This is $2 million um, as programmed, essentially for construction phase services. And with that project, and I know that's one uh, close to Councilwoman Pickard, uh, we've been doing significant land acquisition in the area above uh, the area where the improvements were going to be done. And we've got a designer on board to um, pursue that work where there's some significant road flooding going on. So. That is the end of the B-Class project requests. I'm available for questions if any are out there. Thank you very much. I'm gonna jump in here. Oh, I see Mr. Volke, you may go first. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, hopefully this is an easy one, Mr. Michelson. I actually just sent you an email because funny enough, I got an email from a constituent while we're doing this meeting. Um, there is a retrofit of Turf Valley uh, dry pond or something in my district. And I was trying to find the, um, 
the number for the project, but the, the closest one that I could find is B553800. But on the notice that she sent me, I think it was B553801. Is that the same project? And is that the federal money that's being used there? And can you just give me a quick sort of scope of what is going on in that project? So the number that you quoted is, is the child project number within that larger parent project. Okay. Um, and so this, this is, I believe, the same project where the federal money is going. There has, was existing county authorization that has, is funding the work that you're describing. I actually have the email pulled up right now. And so the idea here is um, these existing dry ponds were essentially uh, created during an era where the main goal was flood control downstream. There really is not a, a water quality element associated with, with those facilities. So what we do is oftentimes, and I'd have to dig into this specific project a little bit more to get back to you with a, a, a great answer, but uh, to create a, a water quality feature, usually a stormwater wetland in those basins so that we're providing water quality treatment in addition to the flood control treatment uh, that those facilities have provided in the past. So I'm happy to dig into that and, and get you some additional details. The, the federal funding is actually going to be going for some more broad scale stream restoration work in that part of Rock Creek. There's a lot of actually um, uh, uh, utility infrastructure essentially in the stream valley there. And so uh, the, work, the goal is to provide sort of the dual duty of protecting that uh, utility, wastewater, uh, drinking water infrastructure, as well as uh, do the stream restoration work in this federal earmark will uh, greatly assist us in being uh, able to accomplish that. So I'll get back to you with more details on that specific project though. Perfect, thank you. Sure. Mr. Prusky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Michelson, thank you again for the updates. Uh, this is very helpful uh, for the budget process. I do have a question for you though, because I'm considering some legislation. Uh, have you found littering and trash uh, as far as these construction uh, re restoration projects getting progressively worse. Um, I I've kind of been in some of the tributaries uh, along some of our major arteries and, and highways, and I just see it getting worse. And I, I say that because obviously there's the environmental impact, but long-term in terms of drainage, I mean, I found one where completely an outfall was just, you know, full of water bottles and other things. And of course, you know, that has an impact, but I, I was just curious if you're seeing that countywide uh, and if so, are there particular areas? Uh, again, I'm considering some legislation in regards to, to littering, uh, but I, I want to get your opinion about what you're seeing in terms of uh, when you're doing these projects. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I think, again, this is purely anecdotal, but it feels like during the sort of COVID period, it does seem like maybe especially like roadside tr trash uh, got worse. I don't know if that's, I, I think part of that maybe is because some of the cleanup efforts were, um, were interrupted essentially as a result of that. I know uh, some of the things that the department has done historically using uh, inmates to help with roadside cleanup. I think um, that was delayed a bit. Certainly Alex would be in a much better position to um, talk to that than I am. Uh, but I think that probably, um, I guess from my perspective before um, you know, taking um, any action that's too dramatic, it would be interesting to see if that uh, addresses itself sort of over the course of the next year as we get back to some normalcy where maybe there's more, um, more like I say, routine cleanups either from volunteers or from uh, county staff. Um, uh, but one of the things I will point out, Councilman Pruski, is that oftentimes, you know, our projects are usually uh, designed to, to trap sediments and nutrients. And so a, a great example, uh, is the Furnace uh, Branch Stream Restoration Project that we did in Glen Burnie, where that project went in and um, it's, it looks beautiful. It's great. There's uh, all sorts of vegetation and whatnot, but it is trapping a tremendous amount of trash that's coming from up above it, uh, basically sort of downtown Glen Burnie, if you will, that was simply being blown out into the Patapsco River before that project was in there. It was basically a big concrete channel. And so sometimes... Um, there's a little pushback from residents because, well, oh, there's there's trash in the project. Well, the, the project is not, uh, you know, creating the trash. The, the project is trapping the trash. And so we just need to figure out, I think, as a community, the best ways to, to address it once the, tra the trash is there. Certainly, it's a lot easier to get the trash out of a out of a wetland or a, a stream restoration project than it is to try to fish it out of the Patapsco once it's been blasted there. So, um, uh, this is an issue where we, we try to work with community groups. There's lots of 
of wonderful groups in each of the districts doing, you know, volunteer cleanups, whether it be Boy Scout or Girl Scout groups or uh, watershed groups. Um, but we, we try to coordinate those efforts uh, closely with uh, sites where we see that being a problem. So I appreciate the question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I just do one quick follow up? Sure. Thank you. No, I appreciate that, Mr. Michelson. I, and I agree about the volunteering and pieces, but I think what a lot of people don't realize, and when I did a visit on the Chesapeake Bay with some crabbers, you don't understand that what you throw downstream goes downstream. And so obviously when you talk about our seafood prices going up and other people don't think that, you know, you throwing a bottle out the window doesn't have an impact. It eventually goes somewhere. And so again, uh, what I'm looking at is more the enforcement end. Uh, it, it has to be combined though with a public education campaign. Uh, I, I can't speak for everyone here, but uh, there used to be a big one where if you give a hoot, don't pollute. Uh, I'd be aging myself here, but um, certainly there was a, a big PR campaign, and I think we need to do more, to be honest with you, because I don't see it getting better, but I appreciate uh, the efforts that you guys are doing, but it actually educates people about that collection, right? When you do those restoration projects, you see that, but what people don't realize, it goes down river, and if I'm eating at a, you know, looking for my crabs in Annapolis and saying, why is the prices double? Well, sure, there's workers or shortages, but guess what? If the water isn't clean and the crab population isn't good, you know, it's all connected. So again, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, before I go to Ms. Fiedler, Mr. Phipps, were you um, wanting to chime in on this particular topic? Yeah, I, I just want to uh, further on uh, Eric's response that um, what we're also doing, Councilman Prisky, is recently over the last year, what we call litter blitzes. And we're coordinating with State Highway Administration and we're selecting corridors north, south, east, and west of the county and central to focus on areas where they're hitting their roads and we're hitting our roads so that we're concentrating our forces in a particular corridor. And we're, our hope is not only are we picking up the litter that's been left there, but that the public that's traveling by recognizes the commitment that the public agencies are putting into cleaning up the mess that's left by others. Um, and maybe that will resonate, you know, they'll see, wow, I'm. So my county tax dollars, my state tax dollars, whatever, are going to picking up litter that the county and the state didn't generate. They came from us, the people. So we're hoping that leading by example, that may resonate through the public. And as well, we're picking up tons of trash at the same time. So um, I think it goes with Eric's suggestion. Let's see how between, you know, um, our attempts to get back to normal with COVID, as well as let's see how these litter blitzes um, can really change uh, the landscape, improve it. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. I don't have a question. I just want to thank Mr. Michelson since you were here with us today. You've been so responsive on some pretty challenging cases in District 5. We have some communities built on some very tight, winding, hilly roads, and water goes where water wants to. And I just sincerely appreciate your efforts and help. Thank you very much. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, just District 7. Um, I'm going to follow up that with, with another thank you. I know on Long Point specifically, we've talked a number of times. Um, so I was very excited to see that in there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. It was worth the boat ride. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to jump in with a question here. Um, Mr. Michelson, you know that I've, um, with the Severn River Commission that I, I serve on as um, part of my role on the council here, um, we've talked a lot about um, incorporating beavers, or I guess I'd say reincorporating beavers um, in terms of helping our um, tributaries, our watershed, water quality, um, erosion control, a lot of the projects that you have mentioned. Um, I'm just curious if there are opportunities to incorporate um, beavers who are, you know, who can sometimes do that engineering work, um, you know, uh, sort of in, in nature's way. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious where um, where you're at with that. All right, well, you hit on a hot topic. This, you know, I could take an hour here, but I, I won't. Um, so uh, recently, actually just in the last couple of weeks, we had, um, uh, a, it's called a pond leveler, essentially a device to allow the beaver to remain 
uh, without creating too much flooding installed over in Annapolis Roads, a couple of your constituents um, uh, who live by a project that we did uh, just downstream of the, uh, the golf course there, um, a, a beaver had moved into the site and, and the property owner whose property was most affected was very favorable in terms of having it there. The adjacent property owner was was amenable as long as the water didn't get too close to his basement. And so we did this. We worked with a contractor to come in and install the pond level leveler. The guy just sent me, uh, one of the resident just sent me a, a video earlier this week showing how it performed in the rain. So very happy. Um, I will say they're, they're all over the place at this point. So a lot of our work, frankly, is trying to work with residents to, um, to coexist, essentially. Uh, there's a, a pretty prominent uh, complex in uh, Councilwoman Fiedler's district uh, on North Cypress Branch behind the McKinsey Apartments by the coal, where the coals are, is in Severnal Park, if you're familiar with that. Um, probably three or four acres of uh, beaver impounded area. And we've installed a pond level, or we may have to install another one, actually. We've taken down some trees, too, that have been impacted so that residents aren't concerned about that. And so, like I say, um, we're doing the best that we can to uh, create a coexistent situation, a lot of public education, take advantage of that uh, situation, as well as the fact that, you know, once they find suitable habitat, they'll, they'll be back in. So even if there was a uh, a trapping plan put in place, it would likely be uh, kind of futile in that regard. So we absolutely are. I'd be happy to come talk to, to you and the Severn River Commission to talk in a lot more detail about this if there's interest as well. Um, but yeah, rest assured, we're definitely on top of that one. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I may take you up on that. We've definitely, you know, we've, we've um, I think, long acknowledged the benefits that oysters can have on water quality and maintaining the bay. Um, and I think now our focus is like, hey, what, what happened to beavers? And it's good to see that there's more coexistence going on that can hopefully take some of the burden off of your office. Um, so with that, I think I, I was holding out. Um, I don't see any more hands. Um, so let's see, where are we? I believe we're moving on to waste management. Is that correct? Um, so I will just say before we go on, um, thank you so much, Eric, um, for your presentation and your information today and all the work that you do. Thank you. And um, sorry about that. Waste management, I believe we have Beth O'Connell, David Braun, Rody Holdhouse, and Naomi McAllister. You may begin when you're ready. Or Mr. Phipps, I see you there too. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, Chris Phipps, Director of Public Works, I'll defer to Rody. Um, he's got a presentation to walk through his program. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the County Council. I'm Rody Holdhouse, Deputy Director of VPW. And thank you for the opportunity this morning to present the end class. Um, I have a, a, a brief presentation. There are no new projects. Uh, I just wanted to touch on some changes in the uh, capital request. And the uh, total request is for $4 million this year. The projects start on page 305 in the book. And uh, the first one is N422700, Solid Waste Project Planning. And this provides for planning studies and reports. We are requesting an additional $641,000 in FY23 for a total of $794,000. And the funding will target four studies. The first is the uh, study for the Millersville Landfill pretreatment facility, which treats liquid waste that we remove from the bottom of the landfill cells before it is discharged into the county sewer system. Uh, that facility is about 25, year old, 25 years old, and we want to plan enhancements uh, for the future to ensure protection of the Patuxent Water Reclamation Facility, that, which eventually receives the, the, the wastewater. Uh, second is a study for our landfill gas to electricity facility. I'm sorry, back one slide, uh, thank you. Um, it's been running continuously for 10 years and we want to develop a capital replacement plan and schedule, uh, which the study proposes to do. The third is a, uh, a refresh of our solid waste management plan, which is really the prescriptive requirements um, uh, under COMAR, the uh, Code of Maryland Regulations. And fourth, uh, Mr. Prusky is uh, something you mentioned in the uh, operating budget, uh, a study for organics collection and processing. And now we are collecting um, organics, you know, in terms of uh, leaves and yard debris for, for decades now from the home. Um, and we also are collecting food scraps from the, uh, our, at our facilities uh, from a drop-off uh, operation uh, for our customers. 
but we want to look at, um, since this continues to be a topic, uh, even at the state level, and maybe perhaps uh, mandates w would be coming from the state in the next few years, uh, we want to be prepared with a study of um, options for collection and processing beyond what we do today and, and the probable new user fees that will be required to support that new service. So planning studies uh, can spur standalone uh, capital projects in the future or new child projects under the next project, which is, next slide please, our solid waste renovations project uh, on page 306. Um, many of our buildings and, uh, and infrastructure date to the 1970s and 1980s, so we're always working to ensure that infrastructure is available to support our mission. So this multi-year recurring uh, renovations project allows us to care for all types of our infrastructure, buildings, and related systems concrete and asphalt paving and specialty landfill uh, specific infrastructure like storage tanks, uh, et cetera. We're asking for 1.44 million in FY23 consistent with the program and to add funding, the same amount of funding in FY28, the first year of a new program. Next project, please. Uh, next is the subcell 93 design and construction on page 309, uh, that's N578800. Uh, subcell 93 is the next planned phase of landfill development. We're requesting to move design funding up in the pro program to FY 2023 and move construction uh, into FY 2024. It's taking longer to build these large projects, including the lead time to secure specialty products and mechanical equipment. Um, we're asking for the 1.9 million in FY 23 for design. And overall, the project uh, total is $2.5 million higher in this year's request, uh, which includes what we talked about um, under some of the other project classes, uh, in inflation costs and prevailing wage allowances for uh, construction. Next project, please. Uh, the, next, the next project on page 310 is N581900, Millersville Landfill Cell 9 Landfill Gas Design and Construction. So all of our landfill units at the Millersville landfill, including the oldest ones that go back to the 1970s have gas collection systems. And you, you probably recall that we use the gas to make uh, as fuel to make electricity. This project provides for design of the collection system components in FY 2023 um, for portions of the new cell and uh, construction in FY 2024. Um, the, the change in the total project cost is the FY28 added funding uh, for future work for subcell 93, which again, we're asking to design next year. Um, and that, that, that ends my remarks on the FY23 projects. The balance of projects in the program are either givebacks, uh, deobligations, or um, situations where prior funding is, is uh, appropriate to continue um, with the projects. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. I do not see any hands, so right. I will. Am I missing any? No, I do not think so. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for all the kind words earlier. Absolutely. You guys are doing amazing work. Um, let's see. We are on to water and wastewater capital. Okay, Chris Phipps, Director of Public Works again. Um, we have a short presentation just to serve this up. Um, and, uh, and then I'll be deferring to uh, Chris Murphy, we'll be running through the, the new project. So next slide. So we're gonna start with the uh, wastewater side. Um, and I just wanted to splash this up on the screen. This is this is our integrated approach to uh, coordinating all the improvements that we're doing within our nutrient uh, remove nutrient reduction plan to meet our T the, the, the county's portion of the, the Bay TMDL. So we call it an integrated program and it's it's got several components, it's a portfolio of initiatives. And I think uh, to most degree, many of you have had some knowledge of at least some of these uh, components or even in participation and involvement. But the septic to sewer conversion um, program, which we've got, uh, you know, our goal is to uh, uh, convert 200 a year for the next 30 years to convert over to overall 6,000 septic systems to public uh, enhanced nutrient removal sewer. Small system upgrades. This is where we have or five um, small privately owned wastewater treatment plants in Southwest Anne Arundel County, sort of the Lothian, Waysons Corner area. 
that are in various states of um, disrepair. Um, and they certainly, even if they were functioning 100% within compliance, they don't have uh, the kind of enhanced nutrient removal uh, te technology that we have at our plants. So one of the things we looked at was if we were to convert those, upgrade those for a dollar per pound of nitrogen phosphorus reduction, it's a very uh, cost-effective way to reduce a, a measurable amount of, of uh, nutrients. The other is stormwater. Just continue with the uh, stormwater program that Eric administers, uh, which is, you know, we're on a five-year uh, permit cycle. We have to, in this case, we're reducing 3,000 or converting 3,000 acres of impervious area to treated uh, standards. So that will continue uh, indefinitely. Every five years, we'll get a new permit, probably in that same vicinity. Um, I'm gonna jump to the black box there, wastewater treatment enhancements. While our plants are really leading the state when it comes to uh, nutrient removal levels, and we're you know, running around 1.7 milligrams per liter nitrogen discharge, while they're, they're designed for four, we're meeting 1.7. Um, the we can e we believe we can do more or we can do the same while um, increasing our efficiency and operational um, efficiency. So we're going to continue um, in evaluating, analyzing, optimizing our wastewater system, our, our plants to see what more we can achieve. And then finally, um, groundwater resiliency, uh, looking at exploring this concept of managed actual recharge. Um, where we would take, uh, it's water reuse, taking, it's a, consistent with a one water approach, taking uh, advanced treated wastewater, running it through an advanced water treatment plant, and then recharging the aquifer. And actually, actually um, we'd get the, the most uh, pound reduction in uh, nutrient uh, that would otherwise be discharged to the Chesapeake Bay would be um, recharging the aquifer. This also uh, helps to ensure a continuous uh, supply, uh, sustainable supply of groundwater. Next slide. And this short sort of just shows those various uh, uh, approaches and techniques uh, and what they're on the right hand side, you can see what the cost all is in, in a range dollar per pound nitrogen removed um, and uh, the Managed act for recharge and minor systems are more competitive. Septic systems are, are less so and stormwater even less so. Our goal is we don't, we're, we're gonna have to continue to do all of these things, but uh, how they uh, mix and match in meeting our overall TMDL will, will um, that will be something we're constantly evaluating. And on the left-hand side is, is the, the nutrient uh, levels that we're trying to achieve and that's, we anticipate over the next uh, 30 to 50 years, we're gonna have to find another 115,000 pounds of nitrogen reduction and essentially splitting it into three uh, major components. That would be minor systems, septic, and managed aqua recharge. So you can kind of see the distribution there. And that's what we're planning over the next, um, it will be decades, but it's this, just gives you kind of a primer and, and sets the stage on you know, what you'll see in the capital program. You also see in the capital program a continued and, and increased investment in reconstructing and uh, rehabilitating, replacing aged infrastructure, whether it's buried pipelines or upgrading our you know, 275 uh, sewer pump stations, uh, constant investment in those to ensure reliable service. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Chris Murphy to walk through some of the new projects uh, that are on this slide uh, in this presentation. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Chris Murphy, uh, uh, Bureau of Engineering, uh, Engine Administrator. Um, so the, so the, I'm going to go to the first, the, sort of the, the new projects that I'm going to pages. And then if there's, there's a couple of projects I wanted to point out that also have slides that we'll refer back to. But we'll start off with the new uh, wastewater projects. Uh, the first one is the biophosphorescent uh, phosphorus uh, uh, treatment removal project. Uh, we're asking for four hundred thousand dollars for this. Um, this is a an enhancement to our uh, current treatment uh, process. Essentially, we we pull the um, the good bacteria that eats up the the phosphorus off to the side in the treatment train, 
you know, um, um, increase it, make sure that it can grow uh, uh, really well. And then we add it back into the process after the, the uh, bacteria that eats up the nitrogen is completed with its task. And it helps uh, uh, us reduce the amount of uh, chemicals that we'll be using. So a cost savings there. Uh, we currently have a pilot going on down at Maryland City. And um, we should get results back from that uh, in October. Um, it, lo it looks pretty promising though. Um, and if it, it, if it looks promising, cost effective, we'll spread this out across to the rest of our treatment plants. Uh, next slide. Uh, the uh, Manage Act for Recharge project, uh, this is one that Chris was referring to. Uh, this is where we'll take a, an, uh, uh, add an advanced water treatment system onto the end of our wastewater plants, essentially turn the water into uh, uh, drinking level quality, uh, and then uh, re-inject that back into the aquifer. Um, we're asking for uh, $2.8 million uh, in FY23. Uh, to request to uh, fund uh, planning and engineering for this. We currently have a pilot um, little treatment plant right now that's looking at how to optimize uh, the treatment that would be required for the advanced water treatment. Um, and uh, we're looking at a sort of a demonstration scale um, little plant to go in uh, something on the order of uh, 250,000 to 500,000 gallon per day plant. So and that would be a red or protection plant. Uh, next slide. Uh, the minor system upgrades, um, like Chris was saying, well, there's a, there's a number of uh, mobile home parks down in the, mostly in the southern part of the county. Boone's Estates, Holiday Estates, Lions Creek, uh, Manor, Maryland Manor, Patuxent Mobile Estates, and Wasons Corner, or Wasons Woods down there in Wasons Corner. Uh, we're looking at um, putting in small um, uh, package treatment plants uh, down in there. Um, our current request for FY23 is $1.5 million to do uh, initial um, uh, design on on one of the one of the plants. We're going to do it in, uh, in a four four phase approach on that. Um, the project is we're hopefully we're going to get um, a high level of bay restoration fund uh, money from uh, MD. We've we've had initial conversations with them. They seem favorable uh, for us to uh, to uh, get that, and we will only move forward with the projects if we do get the bay restoration funding for that. Um, next slide. Uh, the regional biosolids project. Uh, we recently um, finished up um, uh, the uh, st study on the uh, uh, biosolid strategic plan, um, and um, one of the, the, the favorable solution that we looked at was a, a regional biosolids pyrolysis plant. Um, we're asking for FY23 to do um, initial engineering for that. Um, and overall cost for the plan is, is $105 million. So it's important to, to let you guys know about that. Um, it will take our biosolids, um, AKA sludge that we get from our, our treatment plants, uh, we'll carry it to a regional site um, and uh, put it through a pyrolysis process, which will convert it into a um, carbon-like, charcoal-like uh, material. Uh, we can use it for um, soil amendments, possibly we're looking to see if we can use it for odor control. Um, and also for filtration. Um, this would uh, be a plant that we, we would uh, most likely run. Uh, currently, we, we pay a third party uh, to handle our biosolids. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, we're seeing that um, based off this, we have a, sort of a best case and a worst case. We see substantial savings uh, moving forward with this plant, uh, even with a large investment of $105 million. Um, over 30 years, the um, 30 year sa savings for even the worst case, which is basically we can't actually use the biochar material, if that's the worst case, we have to landfill it. Um, we're seeing that uh, the 30 year savings could be upwards of $123 million. Uh, best case, uh, we can we can use it or we can sell it as a soil amendment uh, as they do in, in some, some other facilities. Uh, we can see um, us potentially having get $227 million of uh, savings. And Chris, this is Chris Phipps. I, I, I also wanted to just highlight that Biosolids management is next to uh, electricity, our largest uh, unit cost uh, to the utility because we're taking, we, we are all it's hundreds of thousands of, of liquid tons that convert to dry tons that need to go somewhere. And we rely on a contractor to take that material and um, they apply it to farm fields. And it's a class B right now, which is not a highly rated um, usable uh, material 
and the state is narrowing the time that you can land apply class B material because it's um, it be, because of the phosphorus uh, limits uh, within it. So the, the class B is going to be a thing of the past um, down the road. And so a lot of jurisdictions have already gone to class A, which is what we would be doing here, but even a step further, because what this uh, paralysis process will do is it will break the bonds of the forever chemicals that find their way in the wastewater treatment stream um, that many of the uh, other biosolid facilities that have gone on in the, in the region lately, Howard County, DC water, don't address. Um, paralysis would address that as well. So we have to do something. We're, pay we're already paying $10 million a year for a contract to take our material that will likely not have um, much life left, uh, the class B material in, in the regulatory world, go into a, a, something that will, a class A solid that also addresses to a large extent the, the forever chemicals at a, at a lower cost. So it is a big number, $100 million in the capital budget, but long-term it's, it's gonna pay itself back um, relatively quickly. That, thanks, Chris. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that regulatory um, that the reg regulators are getting much more stringent on on when we can we can apply biosolids um, and where we can apply it. So uh, the class B material. Um, with the, the, let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, the last new project that we have in the wastewater class is the Cox Creek septage facility improvements. Uh, this is really just to just to um, improve and enhance um, for the septic uh, septage haulers. Um, the delivery um, to the uh, Cox Creek facility allows them to modernize it. It allows them to do offload during off hours when when uh, when staff is not at the plant. Um, so this is more of a moderniza modernization and upgrade uh, project. So um, with that, we can go to the um, to the um, pa the pages. Uh, start with page three sixteen in the uh, budget book. Uh, Baltimore County sewer agreement. Um, we're asking for um, 8.76 uh, uh, million. This is a, an increase. This is based mm -hmm. off the current estimates uh, that we've had from uh, the city uh, through um, on this project with some additional increases in FY 24 and 25. We asked for standard uh, program funding in FY uh, 26, 27, and 28. Um, next up is the water strategic plan. Uh, this is we're asking for out your funding, uh, FY28 for $150,000 uh, for the program. Uh, next is uh, Central Sanitation Facility. This is S777200. Uh, based on current estimates, we're asking for $480,000 out in FY24. No, no requests in FY23. Um, S7918, um, upgrade retro SPS. Um, we're asking for um, an additional $3 million in FY23. Um, we're hoping to, to get some of the Infrastructure Act spending money. Um, MD has not come out yet with the um, um, application for that uh, money yet, but we're expecting there should, there should be some available for these projects. Uh, we're also asking for an increase of $500,000 a year outgoing um, based on uh, our aging infrastructure. Um, so that we see the need for our pump station upgrades to uh, to increase. Um, next up is S seven nine two seven hundred facility abandonment. Uh, we're asking for um, uh, two hundred ninety four thousand uh, dollars in uh, FY twenty three, um, with uh, and an increase uh, in in FY twenty four based off the current estimate uh, five hundred eighty nine thousand uh, dollars. S seven nine 7800 furnished branch sewer replacement. Uh, we're asking to, to deappropriate this. We're going to look at other alternatives to solving this issue that's out there right now. Um, right now, I think we're just going to. Um, it's a it's an issue that uh, it's a it's sort of a long term issue where there's a, a gravity sewer that's at a zero percent grade, and uh, but there's no real best way to um, to solve that issue. Um, but we haven't had any uh, any issues out there. So we're good, just going to do some routine cleaning out there while we try to solve a, a better issue. Um, it's one of those where in, in the model, it shows that there's a capacity issue, but we haven't had anything, um, any spills or anything out there. Um, next up is S797900 Broadneck WRF upgrade. 
Um, we're shifted funding out to FY24 based on the current schedule. Um, S798100 for water SCADA upgrade, uh, deappropriating this uh, $80,000, the project is complete. Uh, S799200, uh, Mayo collection system upgrade. Um, we're asking for uh, $2.5 million in FY23. Um, and additional funding in FY24, 25, and 26 and ongoing. Um, this is based off the current estimate uh, for the upgrades that are required. S802300, WRF infrastructure upgrade retro. Uh, we're asking for 1.15 million in FY23, uh, and then out, uh, outgoing a million dollars a year through to FY28 uh, per the program. Uh, Grease grit facility. Uh, we are uh, deappropriating $377,000. Project is, is complete there. Marley uh, SPS upgrade S805400. Uh, project is complete and we're we'll deappropriating $16,000 there. Cox Creek WRF uh, non ENR project uh, requesting an additional $874,000 based off the, the current estimate. SPS uh, gener uh, facility generator replacement, S806200. Uh, we had added out your funding of $2.5 million and uh, the uh, $2.5 million in FY23 per the program. Patuxent WRF uh, expansion, uh, we're deappropriating $98,000 based off um, the uh, project is complete. Okay, so um, S806600, Maryland City WRF expansion. Uh, we're asking for $321,000 um, based off the, uh, the current uh, cost estimate out there. S807-300, Annapolis WRF upgrade. Um, I'd like to just re refer to the slides um, on page 10 of the slides, the PDF. Yeah. So um, at, at Annapolis, we, we have an ongoing um, upgrade project out there um, during tropical storm ISIS, I, I, I can never quite remember pronouncing this one, but uh, we had several um, ongoing issues with our power distribution system and emergency power. Um, the, the system aged. Um, we actually got a, a large spill out there. I think it was roughly, if I remember, it was about 76,000 gallon spill out there because of our uh, power uh, distribution system. Um, uh, we lost power out there. And by the time the generators started up and everything came up back on board, the uh, plant couldn't keep up with the flow that was coming in um, and we ended up getting a spill so we could get it back uh, back in line and get the pumps everything up and running. Um, so we're, we're spending um, the systems aged uh, at the end of its useful life so we're requesting uh, additional funds for that so that's the, the uh, most of the major cost for the increase we're asking for 17.8 million dollars for FY23 and with an additional 3.9 million dollars in FY24. And then um, we can go back to the to the pages. Now we're back on page uh, 333, uh, the Broadneck Clarifier Rehab. Um, we're asking for additional $590,000 uh, based off the current estimates. Um, S807-600, um, we're requesting $6.4 million. This is an increase of 2.375. Million dollars um, is based off we, we've, uh, we've now that we've gotten into design and, and gotten to know the plant better, we have better mm -hmm. estimates. Um, so we're, we're, we're pretty, um, uh, we're, we're, we have much better design with this. So we kind of know what the costs are, are better now. Um, also, we've had initial conversations with MDE. We should be getting some bay restoration fund money for the project. Um, but we've just, uh, we've had just an initial conversations with them. Uh, Brock Ridge Road sewer replacement. Uh, we're deappropriating $117,000. Uh, the project is complete. Uh, Cox Creek grit system improvements. We're asking an additional $536,000 based off current estimates. Um, S808-200 grinder pump replacement program. Uh, we're asking for $500,000 based off the, the uh, um, current, pro current program and also in the out year of FY28. S808-300, Broadwater Ops Building Edition. We're asking for $703,000 based off the, uh, the current estimate. I think we, we received um, bids um, and they came in um, a little bit higher than we had imagined. Um, it's a request for the additional funds. 
Um, Edgewater Beach uh, Sewer Project S808-500. Uh, the petition, uh, my understanding, the petition was, was voted down. Uh, we have shifted the money out to FY25 in case there is a revised petition that comes along. Um, so still, still working with Edgewater Beach on that one. Point Field Landing S808-700. Um, that petition was voted down. Uh, we weren't, we're not going to request um, to shift the project out. We're just going to deappropriate that. Um, Broadwater Grit System Replacement. S809000, uh, increasing that based off the, the current um, budget, the current, current request uh, cost estimate, uh, $848,000. Uh, S809300, uh, Broadwater WRF um, lower building upgrade, requesting uh, $522,000 in FY23 based off the current estimate. S809400, we're requesting $1.65 million based off of the program. Excellent clarifier rehab S809500. Um, we're shifting um, the uh, um, project out to FY24 for construction based off the current uh, schedule. And then we've increased it based off the current estimate. Um, S809900 is the biophosphorus treatment removal that we discussed earlier on the slides um, with an increase of $400,000, or that's a request for $400,000 for, for uh, engineering and planning. And then the manage act for recharge that we had discussed uh, 2.8 million dollars for fy23 uh, 5.4 million dollars in fy24 uh, minor system upgrades uh, we asked for 1.5 million dollars uh, in fy23 for um, planning for the initial phase for that with um, out your funding to do the other projects uh, in fy24 25 26 27. Um, and then s uh, 810200 the regional biosolids facility uh, as, as we discussed, seven million dollars, sorry, three million dollars in FY23, seven million in uh, FY24, and then uh, ninety-five million dollars in FY25 to build that uh, biosolids project. And then Cox Creek septic system improvements, uh, three point three million dollars to construct those modernization uh, upgrades at the Cox Creek plant. Um, going down into some of the multi-year ones. Um, uh, X7388 uh, sewer main uh, replacement reconstruction. Uh, this is our, one, our, our major uh, sewer rehab uh, project for, for buried linear assets. Uh, we're asking for um, additional 3.1 million, um, so upwards of 16.5 million. That 3.1 million increase, we're hoping to get that from the Infrastructure um, uh, Act uh, money that might become, that will become available soon. Uh, the wastewater service connections, um, we currently have enough funding in that, so we're not asking for anything in, in FY23 um, or FY24 for that um, without your funding in FY25, 26, and 27, and 28 at $795,000. Wastewater project planning. Uh, this is the uh, main area where we do all of our, um, our, uh, our water um, project um, work. Uh, we're asking for $4.4 million in FY23. $3.5 million in FY24, uh, $2.5 million in FY25, $2 million in FY26, $1.7 million in FY27, and $1.885 million in FY28. Um, along with the, the, the program that we're doing, we're also doing um, uh, outreach, we're doing public relations, we're also doing um, uh, the initial parts of the, um, the uh, Manager for recharge project, which is sort of the optimization pilot system we're doing through this project. And also uh, we're doing a uh, groundwater injection study to, to see how um, drinking water reacts with the aquifer. Um, so in, in that thing there. Uh, state highway relocation sewer, we don't currently need funds uh, in, in that for FY23. Uh, we're asking for FY28 uh, funds at the end uh, out of your funding. Uh, routine sewer extensions, uh, Z533200, uh, uh, currently don't need funds in FY23, so we're, all, we're requesting um, uh, FY24 beyond $300,000. Uh, we asked for additional $50,000 per year in the out year funding based off of um, inflation. Figure if, if we do have some of these projects that go through, we'll need the additional funds. Um, and then <clears throat> See, I think the, this is the from now on. I don't think we're asking asking for any additional changes from page three fifty five uh, onward, which is the changes against closed projects. 
Uh, does anybody have any any questions? I do not see any questions. Um, thank you for the very. Oh wait, I spoke okay. too soon. Okay. Miss Miss Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair, Dr. Hare, District Seven. This may be a question that I should connect offline with, but I love the managed aquifer recharge. I know. Chris, you and I kind of briefly spoke about that once before. And my question is, you know, given all the stormwater issues that folks have, in addition to, to kind of talking about using uh, wastewater and, and treating it and things like that, are we going to be able to explore collecting some of the surface stormwater that is causing folks so much trouble, storing it, treating that? and using it in a managed aquifer recharge um, fashion. And if that's kind of a longer conversation that you and I can have, we can totally do it at a different time. I just wanna put that out there as a thought. It's, it's an interesting yeah. idea. We haven't thought of it. Go ahead, Chris. I, I was going to, Chris Phipps, Director of Public Works. Um, so the, the surface water is, is really gonna, it, it's gonna be trapped within the, if anything, the aquia, which is the shallowest uh, aquifer we have. And then that's separated with confining layers. So where we draw water from for our public water supply are in confined aquifers. So they're deeper than that surface water uh, layer. So it would be difficult to introduce that stormwater capture into the deeper aquifers. But the concept of um, what you're describing is what the state requires, infiltration. So to get the stormwater into the ground and not run it off to um, you know, just run off into the bay, but a lot of people don't like that because it leaves wet areas. But really, that's what we're, you know, mandated to do is to hydrate the ground, which requires that areas stay wet versus dry. So, um, you know, in a lot of areas, as you know, the clay, they don't drain well, um, they don't infiltrate well. So there's a lot of challenges with it. But we can okay. we can have more discussion offline. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to both um, piggyback on Ms. Harris' question and uh, go a little bit further on that idea of the regional biosolids project. Uh, the first question I have is, um, is this essentially, have we already committed to going in this direction? Or is part of the $3 million for the coming fiscal year uh, include, still include the consideration of will we definitely want to go this way? Yeah, so, so we go, go ahead. You can answer, Chris. Yeah. Well, I'm, you're talking, Councilwoman Lacey, you're, discri you're discussing the biosolids project? Yes. Yeah, we, we have to do something because. Um, these these contracts are going to be up for renewal eventually, and uh, with the sole source provider. Uh, and you know, right now, Class B uh, material is is not going to be it's not going to be um, viable for very long. So we're looking long term to to get out of this sole source Class B um, world that we're in. And I would say that a solution has to be we have to come up with another solution now. Whether we run this facility, we build it, and then oper you know, contract operation out, that, that's another possibility. But we need a new um, solution than what we're currently doing. So then in the uh, project description, at least for the coming year, if we have planning and land acquisition and design, uh, I just wonder if you know, we don't, we don't want to leap ahead too far when there are a lot of technological considerations that should be studied and examined, right? I mean, producing biochar is energy intensive, um, and we have to balance whether that energy is essentially worth it for the product that we produce. Uh, biochar could be great for amending soil where we have clay that needs to absorb more water if we had the ability to go and you know, dig some holes, like put aeration, but for biochar, right? Because it's a carbon filter. It's basically what it is. It's not otherwise amending a soil with things that like homeowners are going to want, but it could help improve drainage, or at least in the sense of taking areas that are wet and it's going to hold that water from the clay a little bit better and perhaps meet multiple goals. But I guess what, what I'd like to see, I, I completely agree with you. We need to be um, very forward thinking and planning for this, you know, uh, 30 year horizon. Um, 
but I don't, I wonder whether existing technologies that have been, you know, proven for quite a bit longer than the biochar process, because my understanding is we're still studying really what are the full, uh, the full cyclical effects of biochar, how we create it with a pyrolysis, how, um, what, you know, chemicals remain after that process, um, and how it can be applied. We need to make sure we've compared that to a baseline of, okay, if you were using, um, uh, not just, you know, ordinary um, clarifiers and addition of chemicals um, and then carbon filters and, mic you know, microfiltration or sand filtration or whatever. But I think we need to have a bit more, or at least I'd like to have, maybe you already have this and you could just share it with me. I'd like it's more technical backup for how we would be making this choice. It is a really big, um, you know, dollar amount that you're talking about. And I think, you know, no one can say that it's not a problem. We just need to understand a little bit better why this technological solution is better than, you know, than any other and how those costs compare long term. Yeah, that, that's, we can, we can accommodate that. And, and maybe it's something we should do outside for, for everyone's benefit. Um, because we did, the, the, the planning study we've done so far, we did look at thermal hydrolysis, anaerobic digestion, you know, other concepts that are, are more prevalent, but they, the, the thing that so, sort of turned on this was where the state and where the country is going, EPA and, and MDE with um, you know, PFAS. And none of those other uh, treatment technologies do anything to remove PFAS. So that is one of the driving forces to, to the biochar product. The other thing, biochar does have um, beneficial reuses that we could use internally. That would be, like you said, as a carbon source and filter source in our stream restoration projects. Um, we also could, we could see an application in our odor control facilities. You know, we have a lot of, um, you know, with the 280 pump stations, sewer pump stations we have, we have odors that we need to treat. And we have often what we call biocubes, which are a carbon-based uh, filtration system for removing hydrogen sulfide. Well, biochar, we believe, has promise as a carbon source to, to um, uh, do that. And then we wouldn't be buying carbon to, to outfit those um, biocubes and, and filter, uh, odor filters. So we, and we're actually exploring that right now with our consultant is, what are the market opportunities and internal, what can we do with this biochar that would displace our need to buy external carbon sources? And you could take it even to as far as, you know, carbon as a, you know, granular activated carbon is a great way of treating, uh, filtering and cleaning water, uh, wastewater. So could it be repurposed in the wastewater stream itself to, to, um, to treat that. So we're looking at that. So I, I would love to be able to sit down and, you know, with our consultant and walk through everything that we've looked at and the benchmarking, how we've compared this to the other technologies that we did evaluate. Because I think we had, uh, I, there's, there's a lot of iterations to this. It wasn't just the technology. It was like, okay, how many do we have seven? We have seven plants. Do we have seven facilities? Do we have one? Do we have two? And all the transportation, um, considerations that have to go into, you know, hauling wet solids across the county um, versus dry solids into how many places. So there's a, we, we can do that. And um, let me put that down as an action. I think that would be great. Thank you so much. Just one of the other things I want to follow up is that we do have, we did receive some bio, biochar material that we are testing currently uh, to figure out, like Chris was saying, it's, it's filtration uh, qualities. And it's, it's it's odor qualities right now to see what that how we could reuse it. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilwoman Lacey and Mr. Uh, Murphy. I appreciate that. Uh, Madam Chair, just stepped away for a second. I believe the next process here. Uh, I don't see any other questions for. Um, let me just double check one more time. Water and wastewater. Okay. Uh, then dredging capital is the next presentation. Looks like we have. Beth O'Connell, David Braun, Masagatana, and Naomi McAllister. And I'm not sure who's going to start first, but that seems to be the last on our agenda today. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Well, Mr. Persky, I'm not certain that we're through the uh, waste management portion oh. here. I'm sorry. I think there's no, that's more okay. to go. 
<laughs> sure. No, no, no. We can continue then. Yeah, I have some more good. slides. I'm pretty certain. Yeah, okay. I have the. I got to do the water side. It's only gotcha. the sewer side. Thank so, you. Water, Chris Phipps, director of public works, the clean water side, but I think, well, drinking water side, I should say. Um, I think it's a shorter presentation. Um, and we'll only speak to anything new, which is, I think, only one. And then um, just briefly go through the existing, uh, any projects that are requesting appropriation and the rest um, silent. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to, to go through the, the major ones. Um, why don't we just go ahead and bring the slides up real quick? Well, I started on page 12. Okay, so so the, I'm just going to go over. So the, this is the only new water project we have. The Crofton Meadows plant is is aging. Um, we are doing an upgrade um, to the plant, um, adding or doing expansion to take it from 15 to 20. Um, this is actually an upgrade project to handle the initial five MGD plant that was there to replace its treatment process. Um, it's it's nearing its end of its useful life, um, so this is just an upgrade project for that. Um, and then um, if you want to, I can just go through uh, the next, I'll start start off with page, um, and I will try to go as quick as I can on page 373, uh, I think is the first uh, water projects. So um, existing uh, well redevelopment, uh, we just added um, out your funding um, and added uh, funding for the program for FY23. Um, the water strategic plan just added out your funding at fifty thousand um, dollars. Fire hydrant rehab, uh, we added, uh, asked, we requested uh, one point oh one uh, million uh, FY twenty three, and then uh, we asked for seven seventy five um, on out going going uh, for the out years, um, based off of that's an increase of two seventy five, and that's based off of uh, current prices that we're seeing out there to be able to do all of our fire hydrants. Um, elevated water storage, uh, not, no, no request for FY23, request for FY24 for 5.9. Uh, we have three tanks that we hope to get built in the next year, Heritage Harbor for, to, get, to get built soon. Uh, what they're currently under design, Heritage Harbor, Bacontown, and Cedar Tree. Um, and then the next one I want to talk about is, um, this is the next slide is on page uh, 13, which is um, St. Margaret's Old Mill Bottom. And we're requesting, this is page 13, yeah. Uh, we're requesting uh, $1 million. Uh, this is essentially to finish that phase two part. Right now it's currently in design. Um, so this, this should get us through, uh, inquir requires a stream crossing uh, of Mill Creek. It's along 648 there. Um, this should complete a loop and um, get rid of uh, to the, the dead end that we have down there by the pandanus. Mount uh, sort of area right there before it goes over the bridge. Um, and then just to go back to um, the pages 378, um, Crawford Meadows expansion, uh, we shifted the funding out to FY24 based off of the um, uh, current estimate um, and asked for funding out in FY24 and FY25 for 15 point or for 27.9 and $23.6 million. So that's the expansion from 15 to to 25, uh, sorry, to 15 to 20. Um, and then next up is the Route 32 project. Um, we are not requesting any funding at FY24, requesting funding at FY25. Uh, we've been making some progress, uh, meeting with the stakeholders out there to, to get the project moving. Um, it needs to go through both the Wildlife Refuge and the, um, uh, the uh, NSA in Fort Meade area. Um, so it's, it's taking us uh, sort of longer to get through the, the, the federal um, uh, stakeholders out there. Uh, water uh, infrastructure upgrade retro, uh, not requesting any funds in uh, FY23 based off um, funding avail available and um, asking for out your funding in FY28 uh, and, and onwards. East West, uh, we are uh, moving forward with this project. Currently have uh, two, uh, one, one of the areas is on, one of the phases is, is under design. Another one is about ready to get um, put an AE on it. Uh, we in the selection process for that. Uh, so we're uh, requesting um, two million dollars in FY twenty three, uh, and then out year funding FY twenty eight uh, to get the project complete. Frog Creek Water Treatment Plant expansion. Uh, we're asking for two point five million dollars out in FY twenty four, based on the current estimate. 
Um, skip over Wither and see. Uh, new cut, we're asking for $171,000. Uh, we're honing in on a location for this future uh, water treatment plant. Um, it'll be out in the Millers Millersville area. Um, North County Water Distribution, the appropriation is $700. Water facility emergency generators, um, we're asking for 700 and, uh, sorry, 3.188 million. Uh, it's increased to $748,000. This should complete all the water facility emergency generator projects um, that we had to do. Um, the Arnold Lime system, we're asking an FY23 um, for $500,000. Um, this is currently under construction. Uh, we had some um, outstanding deficiencies that were noted uh, during um, the uh, construction. Uh, that we needed to replace for uh, fire marshal approval. So that's the additional request for the $500,000 there. Um, Tanyard Springs, it's a uh, the appropriation. Go on to the next one. Uh, water meter replacement and upgrade. Um, this is an important one if you want to go to um, the slide uh, 14 on the PDF, page 14. So um, for the water meter upgrade, we're asking for $2.8 million, 4.9, 5.1, 5.3, 5.5, and then 2.48. Um, we currently have uh, roughly 142,000 meters. We do roughly 5,500, give or take a year, which is more or less on a, about a 20 year life cycle um, on the meters. Um, and we also have an AMI project going on at the same time. So this actually will, this is sort of our standard water meter replacement budget. Um, and you'll note in FY28, it drops off to $2.48 million. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, as soon as I go to the next slide, which is, this is the AMI project. Now the AMI project that I think that we've, we've talked about before is um, essentially we're gonna be putting um, smart, um, called smart water meters um, out there. So. We've been, we've been putting in these meters since 2000, AMI compatible meters since 2013 out to the system. Um, this additional funding is gonna allow us to basically do what we were gonna do in about 10 years. We're gonna do it all at once and get it all done and completed by FY27. So um, if you go to the um, next slide, or sorry, um, this is kind of, if you combine those two pieces together, um, this is the, the green is what we would typically do. The blue is the additional cost for the AMI to get that all done. Um, and then it drops off and goes back down sort of to the base funding at FY28, FY29. Um, we think that'll probably carry on for about five years and then we'll start having to ramp up because the meters will start aging again um, back to that 20 year life cycle. Um, AMI is gonna have a, a whole bunch of benefits for us. Um, it's gonna allow uh, hopefully uh, leak detection, uh, better customer service, um, uh, better able to model our system, um, hopefully uh, cost savings um, to, on just meter reading, meter reading in general. Um, so we're uh, just wanted to, to point that out that the two projects are sort of um, both have meter replacements as part of the part of the heart of both of them. But I wanted to you guys to understand why we were asking for two different um, funding areas for that. So, um, and then. Uh, Edgewater Beach um, is the next one. This is on page 390. Um, and we're moving that funding out to um, FY25 um, uh, in case there's any, any additional um, uh, interest from the neighborhood. And this again, was said this was went hand in hand with the Edgewater Beach um, sewer project. Um, and um, that they also got voted down as part of the petition. Uh, Severdale Rehab, we're appropriating $3 million. Project is, is complete. Um, AMI was the next one, which we, we just talked about, um, asking for uh, uh, funding, um, let's say 11.3 million FY23, $10 million in FY24, $10 million in FY25, $10 million in FY26, and then the final $10 million in FY27, and then that should um, complete the AMI project. Um, Arnold upgrades, um, we basically are, based off the current schedule, we're, we're gonna be shifting that out to FY24. Um, so we're not asking for money and in, in, uh, we're only asking for $24,000 uh, in FY23, and then we're asking for $4 million in FY24 uh, on that. Uh, 
Crofton Meadows water treatment plant building improvements. This is, um, we're asking for um, uh, $2 million uh, in FY23 um, based on the current estimate. Uh, Dorsey uh, improvements, uh, we're moving those out to um, FY25. There's a, we have many different things going on at Dorsey. Um, we thought it best to actually do these improvements once everything else is done. So we've, we've shifted it out to FY25. Um, so we have a, um, a new line system upgrade, switchgear improvements, and then we're also uh, potentially going to be doing some stuff as part of the east-west uh, building a booster pump station out there. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we didn't have too many contractors in there together, so we kind of shifted it out to FY25. Uh, let's see. Um, Carpenter Meadows uh, rehab um, permits. Um, uh, this is for uh, additional um, building out there. Or, sorry, this is the project that we just talked about, which was the um, the, the treatment train upgrade, which we talked about on on slide twelve. Uh, next up is on page three ninety seven is the water main replacement reconstruction project. Um, this is our um, uh, water main rehab reconstruction project. We're just asking for keeping funding steady at $12.2 million and added out here funding for FY 28. Uh, water project planning, uh, which is asking for $350,000 in FY 23, um, and then uh, $250,000 moving forward to FY 28 on that. Water storage tank painting. Uh, we have a, a robust um, uh, water storage tank painting um, multi-year project. Uh, they go out um, ahead of time and do inspections and determine how much money we need to spend on, on the painting projects. Um, so we're asking for $2.6 million in FY23, uh, $1.8 million in FY24, $3.1 in FY25, $2.5 uh, in FY26, $2.5 in FY27, and then 3.5 in FY28. Uh, routine water extensions. Uh, we are asking for uh, $250,000 uh, in uh, FY23 and then moving forward all the way up to FY28. And then I think then that is it. Everything else is just no change. So um, with that, are there any questions on the water class projects? Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Feather, District 5. Mr. Murphy, thank you for running through all of those projects. I have a quick question on dredging. Um, is it accurate to say that some, if not all, of our dredging projects involve state grant funding? Councilwoman Feather, this is Chris Phipps. I, we'll, we'll get to that. That's the next program. Oh. The dredging program. And, Sorry, and I'm then, jumping ahead. My apologies. That's okay. <laughs> and I'm hopeful I can get you out before noon. Um, with that, but to answer your question, yeah, we don't move forward on a dredging project unless we receive the DNR Waterway Improvement Fund uh, commitment. Well, um, once again, seeing no questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Murphy. You went through an extensive number of projects and gave us a lot of information. So I just say thank you for your time and. Um, we'll be in touch if we have any more questions. So have Thank a wonderful you. day. Thank you. And at this time, um, Ms. Fiedler gave us the perfect segue to um, the capital budget for dredging. Thank you, Chris Phipps, uh, Public Works again. And I'm gonna um, transition to David. And I think he has a, a presentation as well. Uh, thank you, uh, David Braun. Uh, engineer administrator with the Department of Public Works. Um, our, our dredging program, uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, general uh, goal of the dredging program is to maintain the navigable depths for recreational boating along the county shoreline. Um, as we said, there's you know over 160 uh, channels countywide that uh, are part of this program. Um, the program does only move projects forward that are approved um, for grants to the DNR, DNR Waterway Improvement Grant um, Program. Um, and I'll, uh, if you skip down to show the FY23 that's shown in red there this year, we had requested projects to, for a grant, um, uh, requested a grant of 1.5 million this year that was covered six different projects. Um, we ended up getting two projects approved for 687,000. Um, 
that doesn't include a, a separate uh, grant we got in this program that I'll discuss in a minute. Um, so um, historically, we've been uh, getting more than this this year. They apparently uh, have said they had a lot of large projects statewide that we were competing with on our lower priority projects, which is why we didn't get all of those approved this year. Um, next slide, please. The one new program project we have this year uh, is on page 226. Uh, we've called it the FY23 dredging program. This is kind of also a change in how we're uh, proposing to do these uh, projects moving forward. Um, traditionally, every one of the individual dredging programs has been its own project here. Um, so the two you see that we have this year, Mill Creek dredging and Dickery Creek dredging, they would both be separate individual projects. We've looked at uh, trying to combine these into an annual uh, program moving forward, um, primarily with the idea of giving us a little bit more flexibility um, to move uh, funds around within that program if needed. So in this case, it would just be, be between these two projects without having to get a, a full uh, budget amendment through council um, as we had to do um, in this past year. Um, so the two projects that were approved, as I said, were Mill Creek dredging and Podickery Creek dredging. Um, if you can, next slide, please. Hey, David, David, can I just expand on that just a little bit? The, this sure. notion of um, combining them under one program. Um, in the dredging program, we can own, we, typically we can't dredge, but except between October and February. That's the dredging time frame. Um, and so if we miss that, because say we open bids, we've got a higher bid than we had anticipated and we need to go, we need a fund transfer, um, that can take weeks, a month or two, and then we're outside the dredging window and we have to start, we have to come back in a year, which then puts pr price pressure back on that same project. So you miss a month, you can miss a year in the dredging program. So this would give us more uh, flexibility to continue moving forward with projects if there's a slight um, increase in uh, the, the cost on one particular bid. Thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks, Chris. I was going to actually, uh, that's going to be a topic of uh, one of the future projects we talk about quickly here too. Um, the um, Mill Creek dredging that was approved uh, is being shown here on the uh, the exhibit. Um, it's in the Magathy watershed, south side of the Magathy. Um, the, the areas uh, highlighted in blue inside the channel are the areas that we're looking at doing the dredging. Uh, next slide, please. And Podickery Creek is one that's immediately off of the bay uh, that has not been done before, as far as we could tell, at least back in the back here and um, uh, has a significant amount of sediment buildup that we will be addressing here. Um, I think that's it for the um, presentation. Just to highlight a couple other projects, um, the uh, Severn River headwater dredging, um, I lost the page number, sorry. It's on page um, 221 is one that we ran into issues with timing as Chris was pointing out um, last year. So uh, we were hoping to get the, the project dredged last year. Um, we will get it done this year. Um, what had happened last year was the construction grant uh, with DNR, we didn't get it, uh, paperwork all done until late September or early October, which wasn't enough time to be able to bid the project to, to to get it done inside that window uh, between November and March. So it'll be done this year. Um, and there is a, uh, a increase there based on our current cost estimates with the amount of sediment we found out there. Um, next project is the South County Dredging Strategic Plan. And this is uh, one that we were looking to move forward from our initial work um, over the last year. Um, and we are actually, um, we got a, uh, had applied for and received a grant from DNR as part of the waterway uh, program. 
to um, to move forward into the next more detailed phase of analysis to see what some of the alternatives in the area, um, specifically this is in the Cars, Parker and Broadwater um, Creek areas um, and options basically for um, long-term uh, beneficial reuse of the dredged material instead of just taking it to the DMPs because these this is an area that requires dredging uh, a significant amount of dredging more often than many of the other channels that we have. Um, other than that, we have a lot of projects that we were finishing this year or finished and are wrapping up that have uh, uh, give back shown uh, basically uh, the, the main one I want to point out there is Franklin Manor dredging. Um, we uh, recognize significant savings on that project, both by getting good bids and by working with the community to identify a beneficial reuse for that project instead of having to take the material truck it to a uh, one of our DMP sites. And so there is a um, uh, over a six hundred thousand dollar give back on on that project. So we were we were. Um, Quite pleased with the the ability to identify that kind of uh, reuse uh, project in the area. They still have some plannings. They're finishing up this spring. Uh, the contractor has to finish up, but otherwise, we're done with that project as well. Um, and with that, I will stop on the dredging projects. Thank you, Mr. Braun, and thank you to the whole team. Uh, very appreciative. We're going to open it up. If there are any questions from the council members. Don't see any hands or information. So thank you so much. Uh, let me just check with Madam Secretary. I believe that is it for presentations. Am I correct? Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you again to Mr. Phipps and obviously all the department heads in the budget office. Uh, that is it for today. Thank you for the presentation. I'm sure if council members have any follow-ups, they will reach out. Um, at this point, is there any business to be brought before the county council? Okay, seeing no movement, may I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn, Allison Pickard. Is there a second? There, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. The county council is now adjourned until tomorrow, May 12th at 9 a.m. when we meet again for the final day of the budget presentations. Please continue to check the county website for important information and updates. Thank you all and have a great day.